Tuesday morning. Welcome to Squawk Alley. I'm Carl Quintanilla with Morgan Brennan here at Post 9 of the New York Stock Exchange. John Fort is joining us from Qualcomm's Investor Day, the first one since 2016. A lot to come from John throughout the hour, including a sit-down with Qualcomm CEO Steve Molikoff exclusively in just a few moments. We'll start with Tech Dell this morning. Uh, on a tear, on pace for the best year in a decade, shrugging off some mixed earnings concerns. Sector is coming off another record close, although you can see the Dow selling off here down 120. Uh, buyers beware though some say we're set for some overbought conditions when it comes to tech. Bob Peck joins us this morning to talk more about this in the market at large. Of course, Barclays chairman of Global Internet Banking. Bob, it's good to have you back. Yeah, thanks again for having me. I guess, how, how do you put the run we've seen, especially in things like semis, into some context? What's driving it? Yeah, it's amazing. So you said the NASDAQ up about 28%, and driven a lot by these, some of these bigger cap companies. Apple's up over 60%, Microsoft's up over 40%, Facebook's up over 40%. But interestingly enough, to your point, semis has been the subsector that's up 58% or so, driving a lot of the growth. The other subsectors are up about 40%, give or take, so it's been strong across the board, with internet sort of trailing only up about 11% or so. When you try and put it in context, we're trying to think about what did we learn in the most recent quarter's earnings, as well as what did we learn throughout the year. So if you just take a look at the Q3 earnings, what did we see? We saw a dichotomy there. Right? There was a couple of names that really got beat up, right? Whether it be changes in their business models or problems they're having, like a, a Farfetch or a Grubhub. But you also saw some companies run into some obstacles you didn't see coming, like an Expedia or a TripAdvisor got hit by a Google algorithm change, right? right? Ironically, some of the names that have been most beaten up have done some of the best. So someone like Snapchat's up over, over 150% so far this year. So we learned a lot of different things there, particularly what investors are focusing on, right? So they're focusing on a couple things. One is the core unit economics. Are you making money in what you do? And if so, what is that ROI? Number two is how visible is your revenue looking forward? How reliable is the forecast we have? Um, and number three is that path to profitability, which ultimately the returns that we're having on this money. So I think that's one of the things we learned not only just during the quarter, but that we've learned also throughout the entire year. And if you're not checking those boxes, you've seen some companies punished during the year that weren't able to answer those types of questions. So we are retrenching to the giants? Is it that simple? I don't think it's that simple because you've also had some smaller guys that have also ripped. Um, you know, even something like a Roku has done tremendous, right? So you've had some nice movement there. I think the, the interesting part is when you start breaking apart a little bit more, it's interesting about the tech IPOs and what happened there and what we're seeing. So tech IPOs, as you know, this year, year to date, are up for about 9% or so, right? Um, however, for the retail investor, I mean, after day one of trading, really down about 20%, right? So that 9%, when you think about it, how do you break that apart? Well, for companies that have these more recurring revenues, the SaaS-type nature companies, those are actually up like 40% or so. And the ones that aren't of that nature are actually down about 20%. Or even the conviction point, too. For stocks that pop more than 40%, they're up 30% this year versus ones that didn't pop that much are down about 10%. So it's interesting to pull that layer back a little bit. And particularly when you contrast how has growth stocks done versus the tech IPO. So that 9%, that same exact period, growth stocks have only grown about 2%. So you still had a 7% incremental alpha there for investors to chase. I want to hear you talking about checking the boxes and talking about uh, IPOs and what we've seen in terms of performance this year. Has it rippled back to the private market? Do you think there's any, been any kind of reckoning in terms of valuations we've seen there? It's a great question. And I think the intuitive guess is absolutely there's a dis private market valuations and public market valuations. However, if you look at the data, if you pull the IPO class that just came in 2019, 75% of them today, even with pullbacks, their enterprise value is greater, in some cases a lot greater, than the last private round they did. Now, when you think about that, it sort of makes sense to a degree because the private rounds were done more than a year ago, in some cases two years ago or so. So there's been a little bit of time value of money there. And I think one of the lessons we're learning is that private investors are taking a longer term horizon uh, when they make their investments versus what we're seeing in the public side. Bob, if you thought you were clever a year or more ago and sold off Facebook, Amazon, maybe even Google on antitrust concerns, uh, regulatory concerns. Right now, you're not feeling so smart. Well, what's the market telling us about that worst case scenario around these stocks? Is it time to put that behind us, or is this just exuberance? Yeah, it, it's a it's a great. Question. 
question because you know Google, as you know, is up 25% this year. Facebook, as I mentioned, is up over 40%. And I think what you're seeing there is a reason why so many of the active investors are actually trailing their benchmarks and looking for that incremental alpha and hoping to find it in the tech portfolios. But I think you're right, John. I think in some cases, investors may be smarted themselves versus what was already baked in for the expectations. Well, we had obviously huge policy risk, we thought. Absolutely. Right? We knew that we thought the semi-cycle was not going to go anywhere because of cars. Right. Um, what happened to those two narratives? Yeah, I, I think on the political risk, it's still there, but I think what investors are realizing is it probably takes a longer time to play out. There's probably not something that's going to happen here. And, and it's great to make grandiose statements by a politician to sit there and say we're going to break up this company or that company. But in reality and practicality, it's very difficult to do. And even if it were to happen, would take quite some time. So today, uh, Bamwell comes out and says, basically, ring the register, take tech to market weight. We think the trade war could escalate into a tech war yeah. after the 2020 election. Yeah. So trade trade war aside, we're actually cautiously optimistic on tech going into 2020, right? And as you know, there's a nice backlog of IPOs that are coming, particularly in the first half. When you think about the IPO market next year, it's important to realize I think the market sort of shuts down around July give or take, because of the election coming in November. There's going to be too much uncertainty, uh, particularly depending on who the candidates are at that time, right? So there's a lot of risk around the election there. So look for the front half of 2020 to be um, sort of more backloaded with uh, with IPOs. And the last thing I'd point out there is the point I made a minute ago is that active investors are still just trailing benchmark, and they're looking for those incremental alphas, right? And so they can get some of that in the tech market in the first half of the year. They'll look to try and make it up that way. That was exactly my question for you. Yeah. I mean, we're, we could talk about the big runs we've seen across so many industries within tech, uh, but you have seen something of a shift towards value, at least in recent weeks. Yes. Debate whether it's head fake or not, but is there value to be had in, in the sector more broadly? It's a great, great question. In particular, I'll point to August, right? So if you look at the tech IPOs from January 1 to August, they were up about 50%, give or take, right? Now from to today, it's only 9%, as I mentioned earlier. So a big pullback in growth. By the way, you saw the same thing not only in the tech IPOs, but in the growth stocks as well. So a big pullback. What's interesting about that is still high growth stocks, anything growing more than 30%, are still up 60% year over year. So they've still done well, just not as well as they were doing, you know, pre-August. And it's funny, you can look at something like a Smile Direct, which is down about 50% since its IPO and started in the beginning of September. If you see what happened with Smile Direct, a lot of the other stocks trail right along with it in that pullback that you've had up into this point right now. So now investors are still sitting here looking at it saying, okay, there are reasonable multiples now to be paying for, whether it be software companies that have come down on their multiple or internet companies as well. And I think that's what's going to bode well for 2020. I mean, you keep bringing up in situations where you mentioned uh, Grubhub and the, the Google algorithms with Tur Trip and now yeah. Slack, Microsoft today. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, so what What's the incentive to try to chase a new name when the, the entrenched names are so powerful? Well, I think what you're going to see in some of these newer names coming, it's not going to be a lot of loss generation and you're going to see either profitable companies coming out, an Airbnb would come to mind, right? Or other companies that have a quicker path to profitability. And once again, underpinning all of that is the strong unit economics. You need to be able to demonstrate that. And I think that's one of the areas that the ride-sharing guys have had trouble explaining. Is it time to start looking at some of the other sectors? Industrials comes to mind, names like Honeywell, for example, to start looking at them as the other software place. Yeah, it's interesting because when you think about software, you think about tech in general, it's becoming more pervasive across all industries, right? Yeah. You can see how tech's having an impact on um, all the other verticals. You know, when we talk to our management teams and talk to the board, I mean, we think of tech as a vertical may not exist in 10 years, right? It should be pervasive across all industries. And if you're not using AI, not using data to inform your internal and external decisions, it's going to end up hampering you in the long run. Uh, software will have eaten the world by that yeah, point. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Uh, Bob, that's great. Way, way to start the hour. Thank yeah. you. Thanks again uh, for having Bob, me. Bob Peck. Appreciate it. Meantime, can Qualcomm keep growing? That's the question investors are asking at the company's first analyst day in over three years with Qualcomm's 5G strategy in focus. John Fort is there live with more ahead of his exclusive interview with CEO Steve Mollenkopf. John. Yeah, Morgan. February 2016, the last time they held an analyst day. So here today in New York, for the first time in a while, executives make their case. It's been nearly four grueling years, but investors are finally asking the question the company has been dying to answer. Can Qualcomm keep growing? 
At an analyst meeting here today, the company's first since 2016, CEO Steve Mollenkopf will outline the company's strategy for the 5G era. It comes at a pivotal time. In the past three weeks, the stock has risen above $80 a share for just the second time in five years, signaling that maybe, just maybe, Qualcomm has turned a corner. On Qualcomm's campus in San Diego, where I visited earlier this month, longtime employees are eager for the narrative to change. Soon, they hope, it won't be about lawsuits from governments, withheld payments from big customers, a takeover attempt from Broadcom, a scuttled acquisition of NXP. I am very proud to say that it's partially the engineering culture's ability, the engineer's ability to focus on the next generation, on 5G, for example, that's really carried us through some of these existential challenges. Anticipation of 5G has literally blanketed Qualcomm's campus. The company has set up a network beaming a test signal from rooftops here. A special manufacturing facility is turning out parts for engineers designing 5G technologies that they hope give Qualcomm an edge over Huawei, Ericsson, and Nokia. All the mobile operators that we are talking to today, in fact, they're embracing the fact that the capacity of 5G and the capability of 5G is so large that they are thinking in terms of, A, what are the new kinds of business models that need to evolve to make sure that this 5G technology can be embraced by new vertical industries, and what is their role in that? Despite the promise of the technology, Wide adoption of 5G by itself won't guarantee the kind of profit growth investors want to see from Qualcomm. For one, some use cases like making factories more flexible will take a couple of years more to implement. Others like fixed wireless broadband require aggressive spending by carriers. 5G essentially is going to disrupt some very large industries that provide opportunity for us. Why do they provide opportunity? Well, it's mainly because we are one of the only companies that has the, next the product portfolio. And what we're looking for today, guys, is some more meat on the bone about this 5G strategy, exactly when some of these benchmarks for the rollout will hit how much revenue, how much more, really, Qualcomm thinks can get out of 5G. They talk about, talk about having uh, more components, more IP, say, in every phone. But when will investors really feel that? And then the regulatory picture. I mean, they're saying that a lot of that's behind them, but we got some more action in the courts coming up at the beginning of 2020. We'll figure out how Steve Molenkov sees that, guys. Yeah, I mean, regulatory picture. Also, the spectrum picture. I, I bring it up because Intelsat is down another 22% today. This is a satellite services business. It's down 70% over the past week, and it's all because it's part of a consortium that's trying to sell spectrum for 5G use, uh, and the FCC is stepping in and saying, no, you can't do a private auction. you got to do public, and the stock is just getting hammered on this right now. I mean, we talk about all of these different pieces of 5G, John. Uh, I, I wonder I wonder whether we're talking enough about that actual piece of it. Search NFL yeah, today. Spectrum is interesting. <laughs> Spectrum is, is a local to tune in uh, issue. I mean, it's, it's different country by country. Remember, Qualcomm is a global play. They, they talk a lot about China, the opportunity there, the work they're doing there in areas like streaming and, and mobile gaming. They're talking a lot about automotive here today. Uh, and inside the car, the opportunity for them there is they're able to design chips that are smaller than competitors, uh, don't take up as much heat because of the more efficient design, they argue. So, yes, that matters. The U.S. is a big market, but it's also a big world that Qualcomm is really trying to continue to dominate when it comes to wireless. Well, we're looking forward to your interview, John. Thank you. As we mentioned, do not miss Qualcomm CEO Steve Molenkoff at the bottom of the hour. John's exclusive sit-down. It is live from the company's analyst day, only about 15 minutes away. Stay with us. Dow's down 116. At Little, we're big on all those Christmas parties. The season to be jolly. Try our party time Indian snack selection for only $2.99. And our party time mac and cheese bites for just one ninety. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores, excludes and I. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. 
to the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Christmas is such a magical time of year for little ones. But why should the big kids miss out? This season, take the family to Santa's Wonderland at West London Audi. You get to test drive the latest Audi models, and the children get to test drive the latest toys with Santa. There's something for the whole family. Visit santaswonderlab.com to find out more about how to register for your place at Santa's Wonderlab this Christmas. The world is a noisy place, but whether I'm here or here, my phone calls are always loud and clear on my Doro 6620. Hi, love. Yes? I can hear you perfectly. I'm ten minutes away. Get your Doro 6620 from Amazon, Tesco and O2 today. This Black Friday, get Sky Entertainment for £22 a month, then feel it all with a spectacular 50% off Sky Sports, including the Manchester Derby and the Darts. Build your perfect bundle today. Choose any or all of our Sky TV packages and get an incredible 50% off. Hurry, join today. Visit sky.com. Offer end 2nd of December. New 18 month minimum terms or 31 days notice to cancel depending on package. Discounts on standard pricing with same minimum terms. Set up 25 pounds. Kit allowed at no cost. Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go-to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? Welcome back to Squawk Alley. Disney opens the vault and gets hacked. Just hours after the initial rollout, thousands of Disney Plus users reported that their accounts were hacked and information put up for sale on the dark web. Joining us with more is Joanna Stern, CNBC contributor and Wall Street Journal tech columnist. Also with us is Porter Bibb, founder and managing director of Media Tech Capital Partners, a 40-year industry veteran and the first publisher of Rolling Stone magazine, both here at Post 9. Welcome. Great to be here. here. Joanna, I mean, we were, we've talked about it. We were anticipating it. What happened here? How big of an issue is this going to be for consumers? Something had to go wrong for the Disney Plus launch. Not everyone in the world could sign up with no problems. Um, But the latest is they're still investigating this. There's really no evidence yet that there's been a huge breach. It seems like, at least from some of the security researchers that have been looking into this, that this is a classic case of password misuse. Again, they're still looking into this, but chances are, or there's a very likely possibility that people were using the same passwords, the same user accounts on this, or user IDs on this platform that they were using on others. And in the past, those had been breached. And on the dark web, there are lots of places, actually, you don't have to go to the dark web. You can find usernames and passwords. And people were plugging them in. These hackers were plugging them in and getting into accounts. Porter, we talk so much about content is king, but you still need the technology and the platform to work at the end of the day, right? No, but this this hacking, it it, it was a few thousand against 10 million new subscribers on day one. And basically, it was caused because BamTech is the streaming service that Disney bought that that had never had more than a million people on it at one time. So they were overwhelmed, and it was pretty easy to hack. And the hacks mainly happened in the U.K. and Norway, where Disney had a pre-launch test with no promotion, and the, the doors were wide open. This happened to, to everybody who uh, opens up a streaming service when, they, when they're not prepared for the, the, the flood of subscribers. So Disney growing generated. pains like we saw Netflix go yeah, through absolutely. years ago. The biggest issue, though, is not the hacking. It's the password exchanges. Netflix, if you remember a few years ago, came up with uh, significant losses because everybody was trading passwords. You had the Disney Plus audience is teenagers and preteens, and they're, they're going to be giving it around to their gang right and left, and yeah. Disney's going to have to figure out how to stop. Disney, one of the down. things I was thinking about is, so Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus, too, they don't yeah. offer two-factor authentication, right. right? Which we all have set up on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and our emails. You get that right. second code texted to you. There might be a reason for that, right? They know about this password right, exchange exactly. thing. If you log into my yeah. Netflix, then you're, I'm going to get your, the password. I'm going to have to text you that, how to get in. Um, I mean, there are ways to ramp up security is really what I'm saying. Meantime, yeah. Reuters has a piece up that says one week in, it's kind of becoming clear that these two can coexist, Netflix and Disney+. Plus. Do you agree? Oh, oh absolutely. Um, they're they're going to be at least five 
in 2020 with with Peacock and and uh, all, all the others that are coming on stream. But they're going to start to bundle as well. And Disney is the market leader in that sense. They've already bundled with with ESPN Plus, with Hulu, and with Disney Plus. Yeah, Joanna, the field's quickly getting crowded, right? I mean, is it going to be the greatest opportunity helping consumers to navigate all of the different possibilities and figure out how to go to one place? Yeah, I mean, this, I was here a couple weeks ago, and I was saying that the that the biggest loser in the streaming wars could be the consumer. And it is on us as consumers to navigate this crazy territory. You just mentioned all of these new services. Again, my number one rule is do not pay if you're not going to watch. <laughs> Porter, I want to get your yeah. thoughts on the reports that the Justice Department is looking to terminate longstanding legal rules for movie distribution. Do you think we'd be having this conversation that that would be happening if it wasn't for streaming? Well, the movie theater business is collapsing, and it, it's on a, uh, life support right now. So the Justice Department was quite right in saying that the circumstances of the last 50 years have certainly changed. But what the, the, the bad news is that they're going to make block booking legal now, which, which means that the major suppliers of films, the, the still the, the three or four major studios, are, are going to be able to put blockbusters and their other films in and wipe out art films and, and niche films and foreign films. And little, little standalone single theaters, not chains, are going to be the losers, So and so are the consumers. If you like going to a movie and seeing a, a, a different, not a comic book no, this blockbuster This is like Scorsese's movie. worst nightmare, right? You, you bet. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, well, how do you get to the movie theater? I have no idea. <laughs> Who do you think of the streaming giants would be most likely to want to own physical distribution? A chain, part of a chain. Amazon? Well, no, Net Netflix is, is they, they want the Oscar qualifications and to do that you have to be distributed at least three weeks in a movie theater and the movie theaters are not playing Netflix's game. So they, they put the Irishman in the Broadway theater on right. Broadway and it's a sellout. It's a huge success. So I wouldn't be surprised if Netflix doesn't start buying some movie theaters. Wow. I like the Amazon like, option because that's another place to sell us stuff. That's right. It's, but <laughs> You're right. You go in and buy. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe Apple just converts all stores to so theaters. <laughs> Geniuses now the, serve us pop. It, you know, coming back to the the, the passwords and the hacking. The big thing that D Disney's got all the content and, all, and they couldn't be more sophisticated in their marketing. What they have to understand, though, is that they're in a new game. Direct to consumer is not something Disney's ever done, and they're they're going to have to vastly improve the search options on Disney Plus. Yeah. Netflix has solved all of those consumer management problems. Disney has a long way to go before it's working perfectly. Yeah. And they're going to have to solve how much TV my son has been watching. Oh my gosh. So, you and me. It's both. really um, I think it may be on us, but I'm blaming him. He's two, and I blame him. Okay. <laughs> Best babysitter ever. And I blame yeah. Bob. I blame Bob Iger. Well, yeah. you guys mentioned Apple, and we're going to move on to that. Hosting a surprise event on December 2nd that will honor the company's favorite apps and games of 2019. Apple is not expected to release any new products at the event, but Joanna... I don't think they've done this before. It's always been a release in the past, right? Yeah, it's always. I mean, if you look back at the past years, every time around this year, around this time of the year, they do their top apps list. Top apps, top games, all the different qualifications of apps in the App Store. And they sort of make a big web page and they sort of just, you know, quietly say, look, we love these apps. Download them on your new devices. This year, it seems like they're, you know, rolling out a little bit of the red carpet for the developers, probably bringing some executives. And I think it's an interesting time for Apple to do this, obviously, with all the App Store scrutiny and around regulation. Um, I really don't think it's much more than that, though. I don't think we're going to see new hardware. I don't really expect any major announcements about the App Store. Maybe a little bit about momentum, maybe numbers of apps, maybe numbers of downloads, but that's it. Porter, do you yeah, think I, 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 I don't agree. I don't think Tim Cook huh. is going to miss the opportunity with the attention that he's going to create on December 2nd to, to put pump some new blood into Apple TV Plus because it's on life support right now. It's well, not it's doing brand well. new, Porter. What do you mean it's on life support? Because of the morning show, the reviews weren't good enough? None of his content. And he's, he's got so... What he's going to do on December 2nd, I'm sure, is say, look at all the new content we're bringing in movies we're going to bring music we're going to we're going to do all kinds of things that nobody has ever heard of with apple tv plus and he's got to do something to jump start it because the reviews and the audiences and the subscribers are not there for apple tv all right i'm going to make this bet if you're if you're wrong 
You can pay. Well, you are going to be wrong. So I'm going to be right. And if and if you are right, I will pay for your Apple TV Plus subscription for the next three years. Oh, right. magnanimous! Isn't that so nice? It, it, it's done, and I actually like the morning show. So that's that's yeah, a too. great bargain. I think it's nice too. So three years if 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 you're right, uh, but you're not going to be. Right. So the bench over. Right. Yes. Right. Okay, you heard it here, viewers. Joanna and Porter, thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Still to come this morning, inside Qualcomm's uh, 5G strategy. Uh, they've made some headlines in the past few minutes, and John's got Steve Molenkoff in just a moment away. Don't go anywhere. When we're looking for a roommate. On three, our unlimited data is actually unlimited, like four reels. That means you can scroll and scroll and scroll through all the Black Friday deals. Because we have no speed limits, no data caps, and you'll be 5G ready at no extra cost. Wow, so many savings. Our Black Friday deals are now on. Save up to £480. Switch to three, in-store or online. See 3.co.uk forward slash unlimited dash data. Savings on selected phones on 24-month contracts. Ends 5th of December. Terms apply. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Christmas is such a magical time of year for little ones. But why should the big kids miss out? This season, take the family to Santa's Wonderland at West London Audi. You get to test drive the latest Audi models, and the children get to test drive the latest toys with Santa. There's something for the whole family. Visit santaswonderlab.com to find out more about how to register for your place at Santa's Wonderlab this Christmas. From Ratman, creator of Shiro's story, comes Blue Story, the groundbreaking movie of a generation, the story of Timmy. You know I'm not part of the gang, man. And Marco. My brother knows you're my guy, trust me. Brought together by friendship. I love this guy, you know. Divided by postcodes. I'm done this thing. Your boy's done it. An eye for a night, sometimes innocence that. My boys. If you live in them ends, you're one of them. Why are you letting your brother brainwash you? Whoever ain't riding with, man, riding against, man. That's my son in there. I'm his mother, and no one ain't come to tell me nothing. Ratman's Blue Story in cinemas November 22, certificate 15. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. Into the end zone, touchdown. NFL fans hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. He runs inside. He's got a 10-5 touchdown. This Thursday, hear the home and away call as the Indianapolis Colts visit the Houston Texans at 8.20 p.m. Eastern. Firing, caught, 10 five, touchdown. At home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Let's get an update on what's happening uh, over at House Intel as the House impeachment hearings continue. Our Elon Mui's in Washington uh, covering that. Morning again, Elon. Good morning, Carl. The hearing is in a brief recess, and the most confrontational moment so far came as Republicans tried to get more information about the whistleblower. The ranking Republican on the committee, Devin Nunes, repeatedly tried to press Alexander Vidman, a national security official, about who he spoke with after listening in to that July 25th phone call. What agencies uh, were these officials with? Department of State, um, Department of State uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent, who is responsible for the, uh, the, the portfolio uh, Eastern Europe, including Ukraine, and a individual from the office of uh, uh, an individual in the intelli intelligence community. As you know, the intelligence community has 17 different agencies. Uh, what agency was this individual from? If I could interject here, we don't want to use these it's proceedings. Our, it's our time, I know, Mr. Chair. But we need to protect the whistleblower. 
Republicans also questioned Vice Presidential aide Jennifer Williams about Mike Pence's visit with President Zelensky in Warsaw. She said that she did not prepare any materials for him about the Bidens or about Burisma. It didn't even come up. And she said that that is a sign that they were more focused on the security assistance and the hold on that assistance to Ukraine. She said that they were focused on the need for other countries to share in the burden of aid. Back to you. Elon, we'll come back to you in a little bit. Uh, thank you very much. Meantime, uh, awfully active attorneys general around the country. Let's get to Rahel Solomon with an update. Hi, Carl. Yeah, exactly. So Washington attorneys general announcing a lawsuit against food delivery service DoorDash. The AG accusing the company of allegedly lowering their labor costs by encouraging tips for delivery workers, but then essentially pocketing the money for themselves. DoorDash operates in over 4,000 cities and is considered one of the largest players in the on-demand food delivery space. The AG's office is attempting to recover millions of dollars in tip money. And in a release that just crossed said that the real beneficiary of higher tips was DoorDash. The more consumers tipped, the less DoorDash had to pay its workers. DoorDash, which is backed by SoftBank, is reportedly worth around $13 billion, according to its last funding round. But Carl, as you said, AG's very busy this morning. I'll send it back to you. Yeah, uh, after the New York AG sues Jewel. Exactly. Uh, thanks for help. Sure. Uh, European markets are closing now. Seema Modi's got a breakdown of today's market action overseas. Seema? Hey, Carl. So European stocks are pulling back from four-year highs, although a mixed session here as we end trade. FTSE 100 and the German DAX in positive territory. Reuters reporting this morning that German Chancellor Merkel and the country's finance minister continue to dismiss calls for increased public spending, pointing to a recent uptick in business sentiment. And it is worth noting that it is this improved economic backdrop, one of the major factors behind Germany's outperformance so far this quarter, up almost 7%. European financials coming off their lows thanks to better than expected earnings. And a similar story in Russia, despite oil trading in a narrow range, uh, Russia is up about 8% outpatient the gains here in the U.S. And sticking with Russia, an interesting deal to take note of, TJ Maxx announcing that this morning that it's acquiring a 25% stake in a Russian discount retailer, Familia, for $225 million. It marks one of the first cross-border deals with Russia since the U.S. put sanctions on Russia about five years ago. Taking a look at shares of TJX, just up about 1%. Guys, sending it back to you. Seema Modi, thank you. It is time now for a news update. Bill Griffith has that for us back at HQ. Bill. Hey, Morgan, thank you. Here's what's happening at this hour. In the Philippines, Defense Secretary Mark Esper says participants in a recent regional Asian defense ministers meeting were very concerned about China's excessive claims in that region. Most participants in that room are very concerned about China's excessive, excessive claims in the region that their uh, lack of compliance with international laws and norms, and they're concerned about the coercive tactics used by Beijing throughout the region to advance their own interests. Meantime, in Iran, thousands of government supporters rallied on the streets of two Iranian cities in opposition to the protests of anti-government protesters. Got that? Demonstrators marched and chanted anti-American and anti-Israeli slogans protests against the government erupted in Iran last week after the government raised gasoline prices. And here we go again. Mazda is re recalling nearly 117,000 vehicles in the U.S. for a second time to once again replace potentially deadly Takata airbags. The action covers vehicles that were recalled previously from 2013 to 2017. They received Takata replacement inflators because parts from other manufacturers were not available. And the problem, Carla Morgan, is that they, the uh, inflators contain ammonium nitrate, which is what causes the bags to inflate when there's a collision. But that ammonium nitrate uh, decomposes over a number of years, and it causes an explosion with shrapnel, and the whole airbag nonsense continues this nightmare that's been dragging on for years. Back to you. Wow. Wow. Yes. Bill Griffith. Thank you. After the break, John's exclusive interview with Qualcomm CEO Steve Mollenkopf. Don't go anywhere. We're back in two. For thousands of years, at Little we're big on all those Christmas parties. The season to be jolly. Try our party time Indian snack selection for only two ninety nine, and our party time mac and cheese bites for just one ninety. Big on a Christmas you can believe it. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores exclusive. 
If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November, while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, Every journey matters. Going, going, gone. Some things just don't hang around. Like a great deal in Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Right now you can get the Samsung Galaxy S10 for just $29.99 a month. But this deal ends Sunday 1st of December. Catch it before it's gone. Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Best ever Black Friday based on range of products and promotion. Was £35.99 now £29.99. Offer ends 1st of December. 36 month credit agreement. Rolling monthly usage agreement. Subject to status. Phase policy applies. Terms. Each day you grab the keys, pop them in the ignition, and off you go without a second thought. But what if the unpredictable happens and you wake up with something like a flat battery? You'd have been better off if someone had checked it all out, right? But that's going to cost you. What if the cost was nothing? Book a free checkup online and our experts will complete a 29-point visual check and top up vital fluids, no matter what make of vehicle you own. And we're so confident in our checks, we'll also give you 20% off your next service. How's that for peace of mind? Visit your local Vauxhall retailer and quote VX20. T's and C's apply. This Black Friday, get Sky Entertainment for £22 a month, then feel it all with a spectacular 50% off Sky Sports, including the Manchester Derby and the Darts. Build your perfect bundle today. Choose any or all of our Sky TV packages and get an incredible 50% off. Hurry, join today. Visit sky.com. Offer end 2nd of December. New 18-month minimum terms or 31 days notice to cancel depending on package. Discount on standard pricing with same minimum terms. Set up £25. Kit land at no cost. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Let's get back out to John Fort, live at Qualcomm's Analyst Day in New York, sitting down with a special guest. Hey, John. Hey, Carl. Yeah, Steve Molikoff, CEO of Qualcomm. I'm here at your uh, analyst day. It's great to be here. First one in a long time. You're talking about the opportunity, the long-term opportunity, especially when it comes to 5G. I, I believe you said the serviceable, uh, ab- available opportunity, which is kind of like total addressable market, is growing from $65 billion to $100 billion. Explain. That's right. It goes from $65 billion in 19 to uh, $100 billion in 2022. So in really three years, it grows a dramatic amount. It just gives you the sense of how important 5G will be to Qualcomm's business. By the way, I also gave a number that said the total amount of economic uh, impact of 5G in 2035 is going to be $13.2 trillion. So 5G is going to be an important thing. Uh, you know, Qualcomm really at this point does not have an opportunity problem. Okay. I, I want to understand more about that because for, for a long time, We've been talking about lots of things besides the technology and the product. Broadcom tried to take you guys over. You guys tried to uh, take out NXP, but regulatory uh, issues, China kind of got in the way. Now the argument is we can talk about the technology again. What is it about 5G that really is going to be the opportunity? How much of it is you having more IP per phone that's going to bring in more profit? How much of it is entirely new areas this is going to get you into? You should think of it in two phases. First phase is essentially we make more money out of the existing cellular business just because it's going to 5G. And it's going to go for five, to 5G over the next decade. We basically make, we sell more expensive products and we get a bigger portion of the phone bomb in the products that we sell. Mm-hmm. Then bill of materials? Di- bill of materials. Exactly. I don't want people to think you were saying B-O-M-B. It's a fun- <laughs> that's right, the bill, yeah. the bill right. of materials. Yeah. So, um, and then in addition, the technology that's required in order to be successful in that market is also very important in other markets that are now taking on 5G. Auto is the best first example of that, but there are many other behind it. And so we essentially have the ability to take the R&D that we're producing in the smartphone space and leverage it multiple times for the benefit of the shareholders. Now, based on the way you see 5G ramping now, when are investors going to start to feel that benefit of you having more IP in these devices? Well, you're really going to see it over the next two quarters for us and actually through the next year. If you look at our last earnings call, we essentially gave, I think, a strong guide 
for our licensing business, which it kind of sits as a proxy for really the Christmas season selling. And then we said, uh, we kind of gave a soft indication of what we thought the, the March quarter would be, which essentially said, you're going to see 5G start impacting our product business at that time. And it'll come in two phases during the calendar year, one at the beginning of the year, and then another one in the second half of the year when some flagship launches uh, launch in both places. Let's talk about your automotive business. You're going to give some more detail about that here. You haven't given it yet, but I'm going to try to tease it out. You said that uh, that business is growing to about six and a half billion dollar pipeline uh, so far. What is that? Is that entertainment inside the car? Is that driver assistance technology? And what's going to drive growth for you? It's really uh, currently in the business. It's the telematics or the or the, the equipment that connects the the car to the internet. And then the infotainment, which is the, you know, the, the, everything you see in the dashboard or in the infotainment side, all of that is actually what Qualcomm supplies today. Very highly leveraged from our smartphone business. Big opportunity. We've talked about six and a half billion dollars of design pipeline. We're going to break that out to this afternoon uh, later on when the CFO speaks. They'll talk about how that breaks down kind of in a yearly basis. And I think what people will conclude is what we've concluded, which is this is already a business at scale. It compares favorably to our competitors, and we think it's going to grow very nicely for us over the next several years. Is the growth model clear? That I was talking to some of your folks about this, about whether the automakers are going to buy based on the technology that's already available, or whether they're going to buy to future-proof, and kind of where the opportunity for Qualcomm sits. Is it in you guys sort of having the data and owning the service going forward and, and making profit, maybe selling to the OEMs yep. at a 4G price, but having 5G in there? How, how do you work it? It, it actually just sell, we, we do, it's, it's fairly basic, actually. It's fairly straightforward. We sell uh, to the automobile uh, manufacturers because they have such a, a long design win pipeline. Actually, the, the, we, we know much of our forecast is secured already by design wins. Um, there's not a kind of a fancy pricing model. It's actually, we get, we get uh, you know, pricing for value, so it, it works pretty well. There is an opportunity down the road, I think, for people to monetize some of the data that comes off the, um, the you know, the, the, the car. But that's really not what we're, we're talking about here. We also uh, will give and have given some indications that we're entering into the ADAS market, into the computing and some of the algorithms around ADAS. We think that's... Driver assistance. That's correct. And so that's a, that's a really good kind of third step in our auto strategy, which is, which is going to be, uh, I think, a good earner for us. When I visited your campus a couple weeks ago, thanks for having me, by the way, I was looking at a lot of the 5G technologies that you guys are ramping up. Factory technology was one of those pieces, being able to do flexible manufacturing. It should enable a lot more customization. But the sense I'm getting is that that's a couple years away because of design cycles, because of standards that need to be put in place. So give a sense of how 5G will ramp. Sure. How long is it going to be before you're really firing on all cylinders as far as these businesses that we're talking about being a part of the 5G ecosystem really buying? Well, I think you could think of it in two phases. One is a handset phase, and the second one is a phase related to industries using 5G to accelerate digitization. Now, lucky for us, the handset phase, which is the first one, is probably the largest market, and it will instantly happen. And it will happen over the next decade, starting next calendar year, so in you know, a month. Mm. Uh, you'll start to see that in the, in the results of our business. But then you're going to see that kind of play out over a long period of time as, as the handset market goes. Now, then you go into these adjacent markets, the digitization, and you mentioned industrial. So what you're seeing, they're, they're requiring the second rev of 5G. There are multiple revs of the standard. Okay. First one's based on handsets. The second one is really about all the features to make high reliable factories. We talked a little bit in the past about healthcare, gaming, those things. There are special features that we have put into the standard which will come out in a second, third, and fourth wave over the next decade. Okay. It's that second, that second wave which is really about the other industries besides the handset. Let's talk about legal, regulatory. The FTC uh, issue is still sort of hanging over your head a bit. It's supposed to be back in court in January or at least early 2020, I believe. How confident are you that you've kind of got that issue contained and, and can give yep. Wall Street here a, a pretty clear idea of the growth that's coming? Well, I think we feel very confident in how we argue. And, of course, we were buoyed by the uh, filings, particularly by the DOJ, which made a very strong filing. Uh, but probably most importantly was we got the stay. So we got a stay, which essentially allowed us to continue to operate our business. 
and that was very good for us. Um, and, and in the meantime, we've been signing up a lot of anchor agreements. So we, when we think of our licensing business, we tend to think of it now as kind of a stable earner, mm. you know. And, um, and of course, we're using that to, uh, to invest in R&D. We're doing a lot of capital return based off of it. But, but we feel like the hard part of our business is behind us. We still have legal risk, but the hard part we think is behind us. Okay. Now, finally, give, give me your sense of the macro economy that you're operating in right now. Uh, Apple gave some numbers and some projections that, that surprised some people, uh, particularly when it comes to China. Uh, but, but overall, it, I'm sure it didn't hurt you guys. Is there anything that's constraining you, particularly when it comes to this trade war between the U.S. and China? Not so much. If you look, of course, our, our view of the market is so focused or so um, concentrated by the technology markets that we work in. So, for example, our, our outlook is so dominated by the ramp of 5G, which is happening in a big way. So it, it tends, we tend to be a little bit more isolated from the macro picture that other people see. Similarly, with, even with the trade discussions, because we have such a small business, really, with Huawei, we tend to see uh, less impact, direct impact from the trade discussions. It, it's a benefit of having a broader customer base and, and broad geographical um, exposure at the time when the technology that we lead in is so important. Any closer to getting Huawei to pay you? No, no closer. <laughs> All right. Steve Mollenkopf, CEO of Qualcomm, at their analyst day. First one in almost four years here in New York. Morgan, I'll toss it back to you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Great stuff, John. Thank you. Slack getting crushed today. We'll tell you why after the break. Stay with us. I'm a regular in my neighborhood. Next. Nah. Nope. Boring. If you skip through loads of your TV channels, why are you paying loads of money for them? With Talk Talk TV and Faster Fiber, you can access the nation's favorite TV shows, a world of films and sport, live and on demand, all for £25.95 a month for 18 months. And if you're quick, you'll even get a year of Amazon Prime on us. Search Talk Talk TV. Talk Talk. For everyone. Offerings 5th of December subject to availability, T's and C's apply. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November, while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, Every journey matters. Going, going, gone. Some things just don't hang around. Like a great deal in Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Right now you can get the Samsung Galaxy S10 for just $29.99 a month. But this deal ends Sunday 1st of December. Catch it before it's gone. Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Best ever Black Friday based on range of products and promotion. Was £35.99 now £29.99. Offer ends 1st of December. 36 month credit agreement. Rolling monthly usage agreement. Subject to status. Phase policy applies. See TescoMobile.com slash terms. College football is live on TuneIn. Listen for free to games from more than 140 schools all season long. To the 10, all the way to the checkerboard. But he stays on his feet and scores. Number two, Ohio State looks to clinch the Big Ten Eastern title division outright and a spot in the Big Ten Conference Championship game as they host the ninth-ranked Penn State Nittany Lions in Columbus. This Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern, listen to every call and every game of your school all season long for free on TuneIn. Penn State and... At Ohio State. Just search college to listen today. Cutting for the net. Scores! On the goal line. Marshawn scores! Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. It tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. You can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. I'm Scott Wapner. In just a few minutes, we will be coming to you live from the CME Group's Global Financial Leadership Conference down here in Naples, Florida, with a very special interview. Lloyd Blankfein, the former Goldman Sachs CEO, with us live and exclusive. Hasn't been on the network in about 18 months, and there is so much to talk to Mr. Blankfein about the markets, politics, and how he ended up in the most recent campaign ad for Elizabeth Warren. Carl, we will see you in about 15 minutes, and we cannot wait to sit down with Lloyd. 
Scott, we'll see you then. Thanks. In the meantime, let's get the Santelli Exchange. Rick Santelli in Chicago. Rick? Hi, Carl. You know, if you cut through all the clutter and you really get at the heart of the matter, yeah, there's issues with trade, there's issues with candidates that want to be president that are pushing economic agendas the country is not necessarily familiar with, maybe even a bit uncomfortable with. But right at the core, one thing emerges, and that is capital spending. Investment by companies, putting money to work, creating future products, future opportunities, more jobs. But the problem is there's a lot of reasons to think it's going to pick up, but we really don't know why it's down. I'll give you an example. This time is different. Reinhard and Rogoff, famous book, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. You walk away after you read it with two notions, that after major financial debacles, it takes a long time for global economy's feet to hit the ground and start running fast again, and a lot of debt usually gets accumulated, and that makes the entire process of getting your feet on the ground that much slower. And I agree with my last guest, Peter Chur from Academy Securities, that the Phase one it really is more of a truce, and the problem with the truce is it leaves that uncertainty door open. So if you really want to get to it, why is the stock market doing so well when we face a lot of questions that even if we get a truce, phase one, even if we get phase two, does that mean capital spending is going to start to ramp up? At the very end of the tunnel, I suggest that there are underpinnings of the U.S. economy that are better than many naysayers think. And today's a great example. Our October permits, as you see on the chart, the best, the best since March of 2007 at 1.461 million units. So there is a good underpinning. But whether it's the last president who really didn't help post-recession get some of the economic stimulus that this president did through tax cuts, at the end of the day, it's going to take more time and potentially less debt in the latter certainly isn't going to make easy or quick progress. Morgan, back to you. Rick Santelli, thank you. Rough morning for retailers. Home Depot and Kohl's both tanking this morning, taking the broader market with them. Courtney Reagan just spoke to executives from both companies moments ago. We're going to hear what they had to say on those results next. Stay with us. Going, going, gone. Some things just don't hang around. Like a great deal in Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Right now you can get the Samsung Galaxy S10 for just $29.99 a month. But this deal ends Sunday 1st of December. Catch it before it's gone. Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Best ever Black Friday based on range of products and promotion. Was £35.99 now £29.99. Offer ends 1st of December. 36 month credit agreement. Rolling monthly usage agreement. Subject to status. Phase policy applies. See tescomobile.com slash terms. At Little we're big on those little reasons to be jolly, like our delicious Favorina All Butter Mini Stollen Bites for just $1.99 and six Deluxe Mince Pies for just $1.35. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores, excludes and I. From Ratman, creator of Shiro's story, comes Blue Story, the groundbreaking movie of a generation, the story of Timmy. You know I'm not part of the gang, man. And Marco. My brother knows you're my guy, trust me. Brought together by friendship. I love this guy, you know. Divided by postcodes. Let me tell this thing. Your boy's done it. An eye for a night, sometimes innocence day. My boys. If you live in them ends, you're one of them. Why are you letting your brother brainwash you? Whoever ain't riding with, man, is riding against, man. That's my son in there. I'm his mother, and no one ain't come to tell me nothing. Ratman's Blue Story in cinemas November 22, certificate 15. At TUI, we can help you find the perfect family holiday. And with flights from 20 UK airports, we make getting there a whole lot easier. Book now and choose from thousands of holidays under 399 per person and spread the cost with zero pounds deposit when paying with direct debit. Book online or in store with one of our travel experts. At TUI, we cross the T's, dot the I's and put you in the middle. Offer available on selected holidays for a limited time and subject to availability. Booking T's and C's apply. At all protected. Ah, finally another commercial, said no one ever. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade now and get over 45 commercial free music stations. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut the it. The sideline, the man bleeds for three. TuneIn Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live. 
so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane, turn around, jumper from eight feet is good on the Search lane. NBA today to start listening. Been watching shares of Home Depot and Kohl's get hit hard all morning long after their results earlier today. Courtney Reagan just talked with executives from both companies and joins us with the details. The calls, at least, Courtney, really did flesh some things out. They did. Thank goodness they sort of gave us some answers to a lot of the questions we had, Carl. And Home Depot did disappoint in our revenue and comparable sales expectations. Again, the second straight quarter of doing so, also lowering the forecast. And I just got off the phone for even some more color with CFO Phil McPhail. It's his first quarter as CFO of Home Depot. And he said, quote, we are absolutely not seeing softness with the consumer. We think the consumer is healthy and, quote, the housing environment is healthy and stable. So what McPhail said is that today's lower guidance is only a reflection that the retailer is, quote, taking our time to roll out the initiatives and that it's already getting about a half a point of comparable sales increase as a result of the strategy, but it could be getting more. So here's an example. The new website Home Depot is building for its pro customers. McPhail says there's already been a pickup in spending, but there are capabilities it would like to roll out to the pros on that site, but it can't do it yet because of IT complexities that are just taking more time to work through than planned. Separately, I spoke to Kohl's CEO, Michelle Goss. Kohl's shares plunging after reporting softer than expected sales and lowering guidance as well. And Goss said, quote, I am absolutely convicted. And while we haven't officially laid out 2020 guidance, quote, we will return this business to profitable growth. This quarter, Kohl's cut prices in the quarter for what Goss gave were two main reasons. Very warm temperatures hurt sales of things like fleece, sweaters, long pants, and a, quote, and competitive environment that intensified. So Goss explained that Kohl's lowered its guidance to, quote, make the necessary investments in the fourth quarter to be able to increase current customer loyalty and capture new customers it's getting. It says it stands for value. It has to keep standing for value. And if competitors are lowering prices, you can bet Kohl's likely will do the same. Back over to you. All right. Courtney, thank you for that. We're going to watch it closely. Along with Boeing, uh, some uh, Bloomberg headlines that the NTSB is saying the 737NG needs safer engine inlets, which could result in uh, fixes to about 7,000 planes. You see Boeing's gone negative. Dow still down 111. Uh, Boeing had been one of the uh, champions of the Dow earlier this morning, but that obviously has turned around. Home Depot remains uh, the drag as retail continues to be on pace for pretty much the worst day of the month. Yeah, retail's just getting hammered. It's incredible just to go back to that theme for a second. You've got names like Macy's, Nordstrom, L Brands, Gap. They haven't even reported earnings. Those come later in the week, and you're seeing major sell-offs in those names as well. Another name to keep an eye on is Slack. Uh, It's trading around 20 or 21 and change, so well below that IPO, IPO price earlier in the year. Uh, And of course, we're seeing that as Microsoft hits a new high and you've had a report out there that Microsoft has added to its competing network. uh, And so investors are reacting in that share price today as well. Indeed. Uh, Teams, I think 20 million users versus uh, 13 million for Slack. That's right. Greater than 20 million. Right. Uh, on the Boeing news, let's turn to Phil LeBeau and figure out exactly what this means. Again, just the Bloomberg headline for now. Phil, what do we got? Well, this is the NTSB doing a final report, Carl. Remember the Southwest Airlines accident where you had a passenger who was partially sucked out a window following uh, a fan blade on an engine that came off and then uh, went into the fuselage of the plane? This report has to do with the inspection of those engines as well as recommendations from the NTSB. Now, these are 737 NG models. That's the previous generation before the 737 MAX. And while the headlines call for perhaps some reinforcement on the engine inlets and some inspections, this is likely going to be an airworthiness directive, and we're still waiting to find this out from the FAA, an airworthiness directive that will call for perhaps greater inspection and maybe some modification on those engine inlets. But I don't think this is going to be a case where you're seeing these planes taken out of service. So the initial reaction that we're seeing in Boeing shares where it's sold off, that may stabilize a little bit. Uh, not a huge surprise that the NTSB in its final report said, look, we want some modifications when it comes to um, securing these engines and reinforcing the nacelles of the engine so that if there is a fan blade that comes loose in the future, that it does not impact the fuselage. Guys, back to you. Meantime, Phil, very quickly, 737 MAX, getting more orders for that? Yep. 
Yeah, not surprised. The, uh, the Dubai Air Show is going on right now. That is not as big of an air show as Farnborough in England or the Paris Air Show, but it's still a significant one for the Middle East. And Boeing today announcing orders for 50 737 MAXs. Some of those are firm. There are also some uh, commitments for future orders, options for future orders. So this is what you guys get with the duopoly. You're either going to go to Airbus or you're going to go to Boeing. And in this case, a couple of airlines have said, we're going to Boeing. Yeah. Uh, Bernstein's got a report out today, Phil, asking whether that duopoly yeah. is over. Uh, and their answer is essentially no. That's going to go on for years. Let's get to the judge with blank fun. All right, Carl, thanks so much. I'm Scott Wapner. Front and center this hour, a halftime exclusive, former Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein, live from the CME Group's Global Financial Leadership Conference here in Naples, Florida. From the markets to politics, all points in between, we'll cover it all over the next 30 minutes. We begin with Mr. Blankfein's reaction to that new television ad on CNBC by presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren. It is time for a wealth tax in America. I've heard that there are some billionaires who don't support this plan. The vilification of billionaires makes no sense to me. It's bull. She would ruin what we have. She probably thinks more of cataclysmic change to the economic system as opposed to tinkering. Lloyd Blankfein responded on Twitter. He's with us now live to react in person. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. So we just watched this again together. Where, uh, where were I, you? I, I tell you, I can watch that over and over again. It's fantastic. <laughs> where were you when you first saw that? What was your uh, initial I was, reaction? Uh, I, you know, I was uh, kind of brushing my teeth uh, in the morning where I knew, normally watch the channel. So um, I was surprised and flattered to think that I could play such an important role in the presidential campaign. Were you angry? No, I wasn't angry. I was just, I, I'm a little bit staggered that it's gotten to this point of kind of name calling. I mean, how provocative was my statement that I would tinker with the financial system and I wouldn't explode it? Uh, and that becomes, in this kind of polarized world, that's a very radical statement to say that you wouldn't blow up the best financial and economic system in the world. Let me read from your tweet, if I may. Of course, you say you were surprised in the tweet. You go on to say, not my candidate, but we align on many issues. Vilification of people as a member of a group may be good for her campaign, not the country. Maybe tribalism is just in her DNA. That was a dig at her claims of Native American heritage at the end? Well, the, the statement just, you know, it's like looking at a piece of impressionist art. You just ask, what it, what, what it was the artist thinking? It's really for you to take away. But was that the message, though? You knew what you were message saying. Message stands. Eh? What, why do you continue to find yourself at the ire of you know, the Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren? Why? Well, I don't think it's, I mean, it's me personally, but I don't think it's me personally. I, was, I work for a very big institution at the center of the financial, uh, financial world. I have name recognition. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a funny, you know, it's a funny moment. You know, we're getting, you know, in some ways, you know, look, my, my political position is known. I used to be, I used to be a kind of a moderate Democrat. Now I'm a, now without having moved anything, I've become like a, you know, a right, in their eyes, kind of a right winger uh, because I don't want to blow up the financial system. It's a, it's an odd time where we're shifting a bit from populism, where you want to represent underrepresented people, get people that feel they didn't have a voice and you want to appeal to them to a kind of demagoguery where in addition to trying to help underrepresented people, you're laboring, you're labeling people as villains who may or may not have a role in the problem just to vilify them in order to improve your prospects. And so the migration from populism to demagoguery is a bit of a, you know, is a bit of a, a dangerous moment. And not danger, you know, I just, I just fear for the political process in the United States, that's all. But guess what? We'll survive this and we'll get through it. There's a cycle to it. You do say in, in the tweet you're aligned on, on several issues, on many issues, the words you use. On, on what issues are you aligned with Senator Warren on? Well, I, look, I believe strongly in, um, in uh, you know, that the economic system should be fair, that people shouldn't be underrepresented in, be in, in receiving the fruits of wealth creation. So I'm for progressive tax. I'm for most of the social issues that she'd be for, LGBT issues, other kinds of uh, gender rights. And, um, but at the end of the day, I recognize the great success of the wealth creation machine and the less 
successful part of the wealth distribution machine. And so we can respond to that with progressive taxes. We can modify our estate tax, but we shouldn't have unworkable, demotivating kinds of taxes that will uh, achieve equality by reducing everybody's level of wealth. I'm wondering what you make of sort of the, the general tone of Warren versus Wall Street. I don't know if you saw the interview that Lee Cooperman did on my show where he literally broke down in tears thinking about sort of where the country is at the current moment and thinking to himself, I'm somebody who's spent the better part of my adult life trying to give back. I've taken the Buffett giving pledge. I've sent 500 kids to college and here I find myself in an advertisement as this evildoer on Wall Street, but it's Cooperman, it's you, it's Ricketts, it's others who made their way into this particular ad. You know, you know what I'm getting yeah, at. Yeah, I have a thicker skin. Uh, I, I don't want to speak for Lee. He's a great guy and he is a very philanthropic guy and he's all the things he says. He is a very rational guy. He ran, um, he was responsible for research at Goldman Sachs. He published very academic, very careful, um, and that's not what's called for. So he put out a very reasoned paper, very hard, uh, very hard to, no pun intended, impeach these days, some of the points that he was making. But it didn't matter because it wasn't grappled head on. Somebody just taunted him and made fun of him, and that's the environment that we're in. And so it becomes a symbol. Very hard to, uh, at this moment, uh, to just, you know, somebody says you're a bad guy, and then you go back and say, oh, I'm not such a bad guy. That's not an argument that people win. So, uh, you know, I'm not... I'm not dying to be here. I could be here. It's not bothering me. You know, given my choice, I just, you know, I, if I could, I would just bury the hatchet and move on. Well, what's your take on the wealth tax? Um, I think I can understand where the wealth tax is coming from. You know, that's a very good way to, again, share the rewards, share the fruits, which you can also achieve through a progressive tax system, which affects only income. If you don't realize income, you're not touched by it. An estate tax at the end of death would accomplish the same thing. I understand where it's coming from. I understand the goals. The problem with it is it's completely unworkable. Forget about the constitutionality. Where it's been attempted, it's hard. To settle an estate often you know, could take many years to settle a state. How do you mark to market your entire wealth every year? Farmers who own farms, people who own, who owned, uh, who own homes. It's not just fancy people with tens of millions of dollars worth of art collections. It's anybody with a farm or a home would have to establish what that home was worth every year. You'd spend years fighting about it, and next year you'd have to do it again. Did you think about whether you were going to respond to the Warren ad, or did, was it a spur-of-the-moment thing? I asked the question in the context of, and I asked Lee Cooperman this as well, as to whether you all think you're playing right into her hands by responding and Look, just giving more material not, to play my, around my with. My life is not geared to this. I'm not living to respond uh, to Elizabeth Warren or anybody. My whole response consisted of 280 characters in a tweet, most of which wasn't addressing anything that she was saying. So, um, you know, this is, not, this is not a big moment in my life, and I don't know... I, frankly, I don't know what it means. I started off the conversation by saying I was a little bit, you know, in, in a weird kind of way, it's a little bit flattering. I didn't think I, I didn't think, given my non-combatant retired state, I didn't think uh, I didn't think I would I could be that important uh, for her to label me that way. If I were if I were to ask you are, you, are you surprised that there's this still lingering animosity in certain corners of the political sphere? towards Wall Street, that you guys are the ones who caused the crisis, not you and Goldman, but you guys collectively, you caused the near destruction of the financial system, and here we are today, and people can't forget about that. I think people, people who are responsible at the center of the financial system, going back to the financial crisis, going back to the depression, going back to throughout, throughout the history of mercantilism, have always been, uh, you know, have always found their moment of vilification because people who build things, you can see it, but the people who are responsible to make sure the right things get built in the right time and the right money is, spe uh, is spent for it, and when mistakes are made and the wrong things are built, to repossess those assets and recycle the capital, they're not always loved. So people in the center of the financial system play a very, very important role in allocation capital, and in, in allocating capital, allocating risk, but not only is their work not always appreciated, but the people who find themselves on the wrong side of that allocation 
have a lot of disdain for the people who are at the center of that process. Would we be here today had some gone to jail as a result of what happened during the crisis? Is that is that part of this lingering animosity? I, I, I don't know. The people who, uh, you know, no. I think I think I think if we never had a financial. I, I, I seem to recall that before the financial crisis, I had to respond to these kinds of questions as well. So there is always, again, some kind of, uh, some kind of r resentment in the worst time, lack of appreciation in the better times for what the uh, people who are at the center of the allocation process of the financial system, again, risk, capital, um, people, again, when you, when you have the role that I had in my old firm, you have people who have capital to invest and people who need capital for their businesses. The people who don't get the capital resent not, that your decision not to give it to them, and the people who have the capital to invest may not like it if after the fact it didn't go to the best place possible. This whole thing has really spurred a conversation about, the, about capitalism in and of itself. We're, we're discussing it more, I think, recently than we have in the most recent past is is the is the system broken does capitalism need a fix no the system it, it's not it, it's not look we're sitting here there's a lot of there's a lot of unusual aspects to this moment in time where the passions and the uh, and the um, you know the passions are the greatest at a moment when things aren't in the, really in the in the in the greatest distress we've ever faced in our lives um, I think the two parts of the capitalism kind of, if you will, socialism debate are really um, how do you allocate the, you know, the benefits and the productive side, what you produce out of this system. I think that's very, very fair game for a conversation. The other part of it is how of socialism debate versus capitalism is how much of the economic system should be run by the government. Now there, I, it, it's almost hard for me to believe. Only people without experience in this matter could think what we really need is to ru have the government run a much bigger section of the, of, of the economy. Because I know, you know, I know I really want the transportation system to be like Amtrak all the way through, or, the, or housing to be like the New York City Housing Authority, which is government-run housing, or... You know, there are great people who work for the Veterans Administration. Some people get great care there. But I don't know that everybody wants the health, their health care system to be run and to be waiting online for weeks for an appointment like some of our veterans do in connection with the VA system. So for me, having the government run more and more of the economy is not a way anybody would go who ever experienced the government running a bigger part of the economy. This isn't necessarily a conversation, though, of capitalism versus socialism. It's even you know the likes of a Ray Dalio or Mark Benioff suggest that capitalism in and of itself could be tweaked. Maybe more my uh, word than theirs, but that's the, it's of course, the idea. I agree. Well, of course, everything can be tweaked, and these are names. I try to I try to break it down to you into allocation of you know the allocation or reallocation of wealth on the one hand, or how much of the system should be run by the government is two bifurcated things. The labels are distracting. I think that's really what the I think really that's what the debates are about. Should there be private health care, or should there be an entirely government-administered system? And on paper, it always looks like the government system would be effective because you don't have anybody hiving off profits. But it's that profit motive that makes sure you get the best people in the jobs, people work hard, longer hours than they should, you get rid of incompetent people, you reward people who work especially hard and are especially good. You shut down things that don't work, even if it's in some congressman's district that the congressman wishes those jobs were preserved for his district. The private sector can behave in ways that people in government cannot. So no shade on the people in the government. My dad worked for the post office. But again, look at the post office. So how do you think about the issue of income inequality? People I'm, say it's, I like it's it? the preeminent issue right now of, of our time. And I'm certainly it is one of the principal risks to the market. The longer this lingers. Well, it's, not, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, you know, inequality is the risk to the stability of society. And so I think, you know, I think we would have to have less of it. You know, what are the root causes of it? I would say, you know, interest rate policy, you lower interest rates, the value of assets go up. Uh, people who have assets get richer. People who don't have assets aren't benefited from the inflation of asset prices. So that technology, the advance of technology creates that kind of income bifurcation. Uber comes along and efficiently, you know, every, every driver is, never has an empty car. They're driving around, so maybe you need 30,000, making this number up, but maybe you need 30,000 fewer taxis 
in New York City than you had before. Well, that value goes to the shareholders and the initial, uh, the initial venture capitalists who created Uber. They get richer. Meanwhile, 30,000 cab drivers lose their job. So there's a migration of wealth from labor to capital. So that gets repeated uh, because of technology. So people who create the technology get the wealth that comes from needing fewer people to do the job, and so there are fewer people employed. Now, I'll tell you what's happening at the same time. Other industries are being created, there are more services, and we have low unemployment in this country. And over time, low unemployment means that new ideas come along and they have to bid up the wages of existing workers to pry them from their other jobs. And that's in fact what's happening now, and so wages are starting to rise. Are they going fast enough? Do I wish it happened sooner? Do I wish it would have converged so uh, sooner? Yes. Should we just wait for that to happen? No, I'm for tinkering with the system. I've never met something I couldn't tinker with and try to improve. You think CEOs make too much money? Do you think television reporters make too much money? I do. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if television reporters are, are making such a great uh, amount of money and then the, those at the bottom of the television business aren't making... Yeah, much CEOs are. I'm just guessing the that wealth you, of CEOs just guessing, is going up at, a, at an amazingly high rate relative to the rank and file. I'm just guessing that if you, um, that someone must have decided that you in the seat draws more viewers than if you and your cameraman switch places, and therefore you command you, com you command a higher wage for the job you do. Even though when I chatted with the fellow back there, he seemed, you know, I liked him a hell of a lot. He's a good guy, but very this, good the, guy. The spread, and probably works hard. But the spread between what I make and what he makes is probably. Sm way small compared to what you made compared to the rank and file, no? Or what any CEO makes to the rank and file, no? Uh, it's, a, it's a widespread and it's dictated by, uh, you know, somebody somewhere must have the misapprehension that people in those jobs are doing a job that the next best job who could be in that job wouldn't fulfill. Do you, do you think it's out of whack, though? Out of whack with what, Scott? Well, I mean, I'm just asking you a question that Jamie Dimon was asked this, this past week or a week before on 60 Minutes by uh, Leslie Stahl. I mean, that's sort of gets back to the heart of the conversation we're having. I think, the, I think what you have to decide, it's like if you film a movie and you get the number one box office star to be in that movie, and you think, what is that movie worth with the number one box office star in it versus the number 40 box office star? And if somebody thinks they can make an extra $50 million by having the number one guy in it, what's that guy worth as a differential over the other guy? Every industry has its own, uh, has, has its own market mechanisms. I don't, I, I don't think anybody should apologize where they, where they end up in, in, in that process. And then you can ask them what they do with the money, whether they're good citizens, whether they you know, give back to society, whether it serves an important social purpose or whether it's counterproductive. I think these are all fair things. I'm not, you know, I'm not criticizing you for asking the question, although maybe you shouldn't ask it 10 different times. Well, I, I think it's at the sort of the gets to the heart of, of why we're we're having the conversation about income inequality and why people I don't like Elizabeth the, Warren put I don't think the whole people on Wall Street and the, and I don't the think the whole convert, I don't think the whole economic system hinges on whether Taylor Swift or the NFL quarterback versus the lineman or this or that what the relative uh, proportion I think it's an important thing if you're talking on the side about that particular industry or what it can afford but I think the real issue for the overall economy in a macro sense, is again, government. what should be the extent of government participation? That's one of the big debates now, whether the government should take over health care, whether the government should take over housing, Medicare all those for elements. All, things like that. And then the distribution question is one of calibration and degree. And where I am on that spectrum, which was the observation that I made, was that I may be in the middle, of, I'm not an extreme end of that spe uh, spectrum. I grew up in, uh, you know, I grew up in public housing in, you know, New York City. My dad worked nights at the post office. Uh, I might surprise you in that I, you know, you know, I never, I never behaved in my life to maximize my income over other considerations. Uh, and so I might find myself kind of as a, you know, kind of directionally aligned with people who would like to see a more, uh, equally calibrated kind of distribution of the system, but I don't want to do anything to impede the wealth creation of the system. And that's a little bit what the debate should be about, if you ask me. Under I understand. Let let's, let's stay safe to say you're not supporting Elizabeth Warren. So who are you supporting? You're a, you were a self-described, what, Rockefeller Republican in, at, at one point in your life. Rockefeller, I, to this day, I, you know, Rockefeller I have no complaints about. He's not criticized me lately. <laughs> If he did, you'd probably have a, a, right, tweet, right. a tweet about it. Seriously, who are you supporting? You know, I'll, set, uh, I'll let this play out again. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a militant moderate. And I also, 
not just for you know just where I'm on the on the on the outcomes, but I'm also for that because I, I like the stability of the you know society. You know, everybody today, you know, in the last administration produced somebody who just the first day in office wanted to just undo everything that was done. If the government changes in the next election cycle, the first thing is going to do executive orders are going to fly and just undo everything else. We're going to go for, we're going to go back from one extreme to another. The other good thing about moderation is that it creates a more it creates a more stable stable environment going going forward. So, again, um, the radical comment that I made that invited that negative comment was I would tinker with the system, but I wouldn't blow up the economic system. And if I had to say over again, I would just add I wouldn't blow up the the economic system that is generating that that's really in fact the most successful and has the most growth. You know, it's very rare that the biggest is the most nimble and the most flexible and fast growing. But the United States economy is all of those things among developed countries. So I would take pride in it while recognizing that there are flaws that we should correct. But again, we're in a very, very, you know, a political moment. And again, at the juncture between populism and demagoguery, and when I say dangerous, I'm not waiting, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get produce another reaction. I'm just saying it's just a, you know, I just wish, you know, people would call out that kind of thing. I mean, the only thing, you know, the odd thing in that commercial, I'm used to Wall Street getting, pay, you know, pelted. I'm used to um, firms being named, but going after specific individuals who really didn't raise their hand or not really that engaged in the process, like my friend Lee Cooperman, uh, and, you know, it, it just seems to me, gosh, it's taken a new direction. We really, is that really good? Should we kind of applaud and clap for that? I mean, I'm not so sure. You're an equal opportunity target, if nothing else. I well, mean, between I, Warren Sanders and even President Trump in 2016. I know. I mean, that's right. I got uh, from that. I, I, you know, I'm glad I could play my role in unifying the country. How do you think President Trump's done? Um, I, you know, listen, this is, uh, you know, I'm sure that there are villages in the Amazon that haven't seen electricity where they're sitting around a table talking about President Trump every day. So this is a very well-trod uh, you know, well-trod territory here. I would say that on economic issues, he actually, if you look where things are, I think he's done pretty well. And, and it's crazy not to acknowledge that, even if you don't like, um, even if you don't clearly don't like his temperament, and if you don't like he, the burdens he's, pu he's putting on our institutions and the stresses in the, ca you know, in, the fa in the fabric of the country. And the poor role model in a lot of ways he's setting for people in the country. You were supportive, at least somewhat, of his tariffs. You said prior, I don't think he's wrong here. Tariffs might be an effective negotiating tool. Saying it hurts us misses the point. China relies more on trade and loses more. Yes. So, listen, I, I'm, a, I'm a registered Democrat. I was a Hillary Clinton supporter. Um, um, but I would like, I would always, I, I would look at what works and go along with it. On the issue of tariffs, I, I, you know, again, people, it's put a burden on certain parts, you know, certain people in America, that's for sure. But some, I, I, I give him credit, I give the president credit for taking on this issue of how to get, um, get China to conform to standards of international behavior in the trade arena. He's taken that on and other people have just punted on this. And if those people, and if those people have better ideas for how to do it, let's hear them. It's very easy to stand on the side and say, well, Americans are getting hurt in the process. Of course Americans are getting hurt in the process. What, the observation I make about these sanctions, um, let's, let's relate it. You know, we just had a strike at, at GM. Let's relate it to a labor strike. The union strikes GM. Does the union leadership know that workers are going to get hurt by that strike? Of course, they're going to forego wages. Is GM going to get hurt? Of course GM is going to get hurt. Why does labor do it if they know their people are going to get hurt? Because GM thinks they're in a more powerful position. Labor thinks it's in a more powerful. How do you get a market clearing compromise unless each side inflicts pain on the other so each could realize the strength and weakness of their position so they could get to a point where you can have a market clearing settlement? So clearly in a labor strike, the worker is going to lose wages in order to get the other per side to, gap, to move towards its side for a compromise. That's what's going on here. There's pain that we're going through in order to inflict the kind of pain onto China that will make them compromise and get closer to the, uh, our position. It's hurt the 
manufacturing economy, undoubtedly. It's hurt manufacturers, it's hurt farmers. Now, we should, we should nationalize that pain, which I think has been sought here. So, in other words, when you give subsidies and payments to farmers to compensate for some of their losses, in effect, you're nationalizing the cost of it because taxpayers broadly are helping to fund farmers and manufacturers who would otherwise suffer all by themselves and absorb a disproportionate part of that cost. But nevertheless, I can't see any other way of bringing our negotiating adversary here, China, to the table or closer to our position unless we convince them that they have more to lose by recalcitrance than they do from cooperation. There's a, obviously a political ramification for the president, too, as we get closer to the election. There Everything are, has political ramifications. There, they have to be digested. There are more tar tariffs uh, coming down the pike in, in mid-December. Gary Cohn, your former colleague, was on the network yesterday and suggested the president is going to lose credibility with the Chinese if he rolls those back. Well, I'm not speaking for the president. I'm not speaking for the Chinese. I'm just saying why I understand why having to go down the road of even suffering some losses on yourself and some burdens on yourself are necessary. And again, we don't often get into trade wars, but we often get into labor strife. And so I'm making that analogy so people can appreciate what I think is a kind of a parallel kind of a thing that we have more experience with and we take for granted. And so I see the, uh, I see the analogy. Let me ask you about the Fed. Uh, obviously, Jay Powell has uh, endured attacks from the, the president who's now arguing that he'd be fine with negative interest rates. How do you think Jay Powell's done? Do you, do you think that they've been right in cutting rates the way they have? And what do you make of the president's attacks on the Fed? Well, I would say that the, um, you know, from a you know, kind of different you know, perspective, I wish the president wouldn't attack an institution whose credibility is part of its, is an important part of its influence. And we want an influential, uh, respected Fed for all, so, you know, for all sorts of reasons that are clear. On the other hand, in a weird way, it gives Jay Powell the opportunity to resist that and in a way come out of this with the institution holding up its independence. And I'm not suggesting that it's good or not suggesting that it's desirable, but so far, Jay Powell has handed, handled himself very, very well. His temperament has been fine. Uh, and I think his responses uh, uh, have generally been good. Should we, in hindsight, have foregone the end of the year, you know, the last year's income rate rise? Could we have been, some people would not want to, um, you know, should we have one more rate increase, more or less, isn't going isn't gonna, to isn't gonna determine my view of whether he's doing a good job. As long as he responds to the data and as long as he stays, keeps himself insulated from the political pressures. I wish the political pressures weren't there, but I commend him for resisting it. And at the end of the day, although the institutions are being attacked, the institutions are holding up. Let me ask you about the company you used to run, Goldman Sachs, if I may. How do you think David Solomon's doing? Oh my goodness, I make a, I have not going to, uh, I'm not going to comment on, I'm going to be a good, I'm a good lever. <laughs> a good lever. There's a recent article, I don't, I don't know if you... But by the way, I will say that I know who, I know who paid the, the biggest role in putting him in that job, and that was me, so I'll take credit for that. Okay. But I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna comment on what he's doing after I left. Okay, let me ask you it this way then. There's a new article, I don't know if you saw it in Fortune Magazine, knocking down walls at Goldman Sachs, can, can CEO David Solomon get the storied bank to, to grow again? The, the, the implication is that Goldman's growth had slowed uh, well, Goldman, by the time Goldman's, that you... Goldman's growth had slowed. Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you make of the way that that's, that's framed, that Solomon's job is, is to get Goldman growing in, in ways that it wasn't when you left? No, it's our jobs. You know, everybody has a different mix of business. Our business at Goldman Sachs was clearly investment banking, capital markets, very reactive dependent. The market likes more stable income. Don't forget, we were, we were the most recent private partnership. In a private partnership, you can make money one year and not make money for three years, and then in the fifth year, make a ton of money, and everybody's happy. Here, there's consistency, you know, so there was a need to, I think, which David has picked up the cudgel for, uh, build new sources of revenue that are more stable, that tend to be more counter-cyclical. This was started, you know, the march into uh, consumer businesses, when it started over the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, we were, you know, good partners in that, and now he's doing that on his own. But we were, um, uh, you, know, we, you know, our business, uh, again, 
you know, needs to evolve and always does. And I, you know, I commend his, uh, I commend the efforts to uh, to grow revenue. That's always ask, that's always our job. Let me ask you about this quote from Mike Mayo, the banking analyst. I'm sure you know. Goldman Sachs was a victim of its own success. They didn't feel the same need to evolve as their underperforming peers. What, what do you what do you make of that? We had so many business that um, were that, doing that's a, God, great. That's, a, that's an unusually flattering comment from Mike Mayo referring to our success. I, I, think, he, our I think he has Goldman stock on a strong, yeah, on, no, a, no, on no, an no, outperformance at the current from, time. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Um, look, everybody is always a victim of your uh, of your success because things work, and then you don't have the same motivation to, to correct or change things. One of the you know look, one of the big achievements is. We stayed intact through the financial crisis, which was a big burden on all financial institutions, but particularly one that was so geared, almost exclusively geared towards advisory work and, and capital markets activity as opposed to commercial lending and deposit taking, uh, which is generally more stable, safer activities. We weren't even in those business. So clearly that there has been a need to evolve certain other things in different parts you know, different parts of the environment, of the uh, kind of cycle are going to benefit one business over another. You know, I'm proud of our firm. I'm proud of the great people that we have working there. We still attract and retain the best talent. You know, I feel very good about it, but oh, there's always a need to uh, improve things and to move on and to uh, always, always, always grow revenue and new sources of opportunity. Okay, on that note, the 1MDB thing, which is still not fully settled, uh, how do you think about that as it relates to your own legacy there? Well, anything that happens on my watch, I guess is, you know, not, not, not I guess, is part, you know, is clearly part of my legacy. That will play through. There's 50 things that happen. Look. This is a big one, though. Yeah, it's a big one. We've had, we've had a lot of big, we have had a lot of, we've had a lot of things that go on. Um, it'll work its way through. It's still in the process of working through. We obviously had, there's no contesting, we had a bad egg out there. Then the question for the institution becomes, and everybody has, been, you know, from time to time we'll have a bad egg. We have tens of thousands of people. We hope that everybody is pure of heart. It doesn't always work out. And then the test, the institutional test, is do we have the right processes and procedures, compliance, and culture that should have, even though it slipped through the cracks this time, were we, how much at fault were we in, ha in allowing this to happen? And that's, what's, and that's what goes on. And that, that is what, you know, plays out here. But um, you know, I have a very, you know, I have confidence in our institution. I think we're on the right side of those culture and characteristics and compliance things. But clearly, there was a bad outcome. When there's a bad outcome, you look for flaws, and that's what the process is. And we'll get on and, and we'll move on. I can tell you, the crisis of the, you know, I, 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 we don't have enough time left to enumerate all these things. Goldman Sachs is big enough and influential enough in enough places. There's hardly anything that can go wrong anywhere in the world where we're not influenced by it, involved in it, often very, very involved in it. And to be in my seat, the seat that I occupy, the seat that my successor now occupies, means that you have to work through these things. And working through these things also means you have to make the kinds of changes and responses to minimize the chances that bad outcomes happen again. I know you have to run to the airport, so I'm going to let you go with a final question. Markets are at record highs, uh, and we're setting new highs almost every day, it seems. What's your view of the market? You comfortable with where stocks are? Oh my God, I don't think I've been comfortable you know, 30, you know, since 37 years ago when I went over, you know, when I went over to finance. Um, I'm always, I'm looking around every corner, always waiting for it, and I won't hear the one that is. Although, after it happens, 80% of the people out there will think I knew in advance, and the other 20% will think we caused it. <laughs> so, the fact of the matter is, but if you look at it and you ask me, what is my best sense Low interest rates, relatively high growth, no demand to raise those interest rates. And so I'd say there's a very, very good macro backdrop. Where are, now the big risk is, you talked about low interest rates. Well, clearly, if you have a commodity and you attach a zero price to it, how does that get allocated efficiently and safely? And so is capital going into wrong places? Are there bubbles being formed? I don't see them, but... You never do until after the fact when everybody in hindsight remembers having seen them. Could it be credit? But that's kind of, it doesn't feel that way, maybe. Real estate, that's kind of come down. Other kinds of asset prices, IPOs, tech, high prices with no revenue, that's kind of deflated. Correct. So itself what's going to happen that's going to burst a bubble and create a huge kind of an explosion? I don't see it, but because I don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Impeachment? 
you know, I say that even that process, I, I think statistically, it's very, it's very likely that there is a favorable, a positive vote on impeachment, and very, very unlikely that there's a vote on removal. So I don't think the financial markets are really getting set. If that formulation changes, then over time, that risk will accrete into the market, and the market will slowly adjust. The only time you get a, a real burst and an explosion is a sudden surprise and a sudden change in the, in the that wasn't anticipated for which the adjustment wasn't made. I'll give you an example of that recently was when Donald Trump got elected when everybody thought Hillary Clinton was going to get elected. And so then going into that election, nobody saw, everybody was thinking higher taxes, possibly more regulation, and all of a sudden overnight lower taxes less regulation, and that adjustment was kind of a radical regulation. Now, some people like that because stocks went up, not down on that, but it could, the reverse of that could happen. That, that kind of surprise. Thank you for being so generous with your time today. It's nice oh, to thank see you, you Scott. spend this time with you. That's Lloyd Blankfein uh, joining us exclusively here on CNBC. Straight ahead on the half, Terry Duffy. He is the CME Group's chairman. He's the host of this event down here. He'll join us next. Halftime is back in two minutes. The S&P 500, the benchmark. On three, our unlimited data is actually unlimited, like four reels. That means you can scroll and scroll and scroll through all the Black Friday deals. Because we have no speed limits, no data caps, and you'll be 5G ready at no extra cost. Wow, so many savings. Our Black Friday deals are now on. Save up to £480. Switch to three, in-store or online. See 3.co.uk forward slash unlimited dash data. Savings on selected phones on 24-month contracts. Ends 5th of December. Terms apply. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit with our award-winning eight-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just $12.99 and our award-winning range of Hortus Artisan gins and gin liqueurs from only $9.99. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores exclude an eye. Into the end zone, touchdown! NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. He runs inside, he's got a 10, 5, touchdown! This Thursday, hear the home and away call as the Indianapolis Colts visit the Houston Texans at 8.20 p.m. Eastern. Firing, caught, 10, 5, touchdown! At home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. I'm Bill Griffith. Here is your CBC News update at this hour. Boeing 737 MAX jet just got another boost at the Dubai Air Show today. It was an order from Kazakhstan's newly launched budget airline. The letter of intent says they'll purchase 30 of those jets with a list price of $3.6 billion. In Hong Kong, while many protesters left that sealed off university campus there, the days long standoff with police is not over yet. Officials say that about 100 protesters are still inside. About 600 protesters walked out earlier in the day. Police allowed those under the age of 18 to go home after they were questioned. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu traveled to the West Bank today to celebrate the U.S. announcement that it does not consider Israeli settlements to be a violation of international law. Netanyahu called that a huge achievement that fixed a historic wrong. And back here, Dallas Mavericks star Luka Doncic had a career performance last night. He scored 42 points, had 12 assists, 11 rebounds, 
in a victory over the San Antonio Spurs. He becomes the second youngest player in NBA history to record a 40-point triple-double, 163 days younger than LeBron was when he did it back in 2005. That's your update. By the way, the boss called Scott. He thinks you're overpaid. <laughs> I knew that was coming, Bill. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it. Anyway. I'm sure there's many more things being said on Twitter as well. I'm sure. Thank you, Bill Griffin. See you later. Our next guest is the host of the Global Financial Leadership Conference here in Naples, Terry Duffy, the CME Group Chairman and CEO. Nice to see you. Thanks for having us again. Scott, thanks for being here. I appreciate it very much. You have a wonderful, yet again, cross-section of people from many different industries. How are people feeling about the economy and the markets? Well, you just had Lloyd on, and I think you did a really nice job, uh, not only on CNBC, but yesterday with our uh, constituents of our clients and talking about a whole host of things from politics to business. And I think people, for the most part, are feeling fairly good. But what's interesting about the overall markets is we're seeing volumes dip off significantly on these rallies and on the breaks, which tells me there's a lot of people on the sidelines. As you know, Scott, I'm a big fan of your show and I watch it a lot, and you've got traders on your desk, and some of them have been talking a different position than they have historically over the last several years, which tells me they're either out, lightened up, waiting for a break to buy. That's so that's a lot about where I think the market's at right now, and that's where you're hearing a lot of sentiment come from different uh, places around in the asset classes. There's a suggestion that some of that money is going to come into the market between now and the end of the year and push things even higher. Do you buy that? I, I would not be surprised by that. You know, it's not for me to, to predict if money's going to come into the market. I can only tell you what I'm seeing on flows. And I look at prices and I look at flows. When you're looking at the amount of flows that's coming into the market, the amount of volume coming in, it's a lot less than it should be when you're having these new records highs set every time or record lows in interest rates. So you're seeing volume dip off with these moves, which tells me a lot of people are out of the market, which means one thing they got to come back in eventually. Okay, the other thing you watch closely, I know, is volatility. I do. Which is almost non-existent. Right. It's, it's unbelievable how the volatility went from the story of the day to non-existent, but yet some of the re prices are not reflecting non-existent, even though the daily volatility that we were watching has seemed to taper quite a bit over the last month or so. You think that comes back? I do. I just think there's too many unknowns in the world. You, you just had a guest down with Lloyd talking about a whole host of things. It's almost impossible for volatility not to come back into the equation. You have uncertainty in Britain. You've got an election coming up December 12th. You have an election coming up here in the United States uh, next year, and it couldn't be more polarizing in which way the, the markets could go because of the direction of who is going to sit in the Oval Office. So that's going to create uncertainty. I think 2020 could be a very volatile year for a whole host of reasons. I'll play off another thing that Lloyd said since you, you're referencing it. Maybe all of those risks are mitigated by one thing, and that's central bank easing, not only here but everywhere else. And maybe that's the, pardon the pun, the trump card that supersedes everything. I, you know, I, I've heard you and your colleagues talk about the Fed quite a bit. And from where I sit, I, I think, well, how much lower can they go and how much of an effect can they have on the overall marketplace? I think we're at the point right now where they have zero effect. I don't think the U.S. is going to negative rates, and I don't think they're going to raise in the near term anytime soon. So what really, what role is the Fed going to play in the United States? There's $14 trillion that are getting negative rates globally today, and it's not going very well for those people that are participating in that. So they're going to look for different asset classes to participate in. But wouldn't you in some respects go out further on the risk curve if you knew that you had a quote-unquote insurance policy in your back pocket of the Fed? I don't think it's an insurance policy, Scott. I just have a different viewpoint of it. I don't know what the insurance is. I guess I would, anytime you buy insurance, you normally know what the insurance is for. So if you're telling me the Fed's going to bail me out and take the equities higher, I don't buy that argument. The equities have gone to record highs with the Fed basically rate tightening three times, and now here we are with uh, rate cuts over the last two sessions. We're, this, the market has said we don't care what the Fed does. Where do you think rates are going? Like ten year? What, what do you think makes sense? You know, it's sense hard to, to predict you. where the rates are. I'm here to manage the risk of the ten year, the two, the fives, and everything else. But it is interesting that um, it's hard to believe that they're going to continue to stay inverted. And I and I have a hard time thinking that rates are going to stay this low forever. But you know, where everybody's watching the inflation number, we got sub two percent inflation. So there's really no reason for the rates to do much. It doesn't mean people don't have rate exposure, though, Scott. And I think that's what people are missing. Credit card uh, interest rates are 20%. We got $1.6 trillion in credit card debt. We have $46 trillion in mortgages with a whole host of different uh, durations of interest rates associated. People need to manage that risk. So even though the rates may not be going anywhere in the near term, you and I don't get Fed fund borrowing rates. So there's a whole host of exposures and interest rates, even though they're not moving. Do you 
leap you're making into Bitcoin even further? Options starting <laughs> next year? I'm a big believer, Scott, that options help the credibility of any futures contract to build that ecosystem of futures and options together. Um, we have now listed the futures for a year. It's become somewhat attractive to people. So the options was a natural thing next to do. It doesn't mean we're going to go into other cryptos. So I've said from day one, I will walk, not run into this. I don't want people who have never traded futures trading Bitcoin on CME. I want sophisticated uh, participants in the marketplace. You may get some speculators in there, though. You might get some speculators. Terry, thanks for having us. Thank, uh, Always a pleasure it, being here. Thank you. Here. That's Terry Duffy again, the chairman of the CME Group, down here at his conference in Naples, Florida. Coming up next on the half, Mike Harris of Campbell and Company is going to weigh in on this record-breaking market. But first, Andrew Ross Sorkin has a look at what's coming up I'm, on the exchange. On. I just need to say, I'm giving you a raise, Scott. I know that people are giving you a hard. I'm, I, you need a raise. That was pay-per-view TV. I just want to say, fabulous interview. So there. Thanks. I'll send you a check. Um, well, but it's in the mail. Uh, tech stocks on pace for their best year in a decade, but there's one indicator that could signal trouble ahead, what it is and what it could mean for the sector. Plus, his agency is taking the lead on regulating cryptocurrencies. The chairman of the CFTC is going to join us live straight ahead. And then Boeing's latest headache could lead to the redesign of thousands of its planes. And we're not talking about the 737 MAX. That's all ahead on the exchange. The Halftime Report is back after this. Still have service? Tis the season to be hunched over your laptop. Not on our watch. In real life, you can feel your senses and your baskets. Feel all the sights, sounds, lols, and OMGs. Wear laughing emojis on actual smiley faces. Battery is running low. Take the kids to Santa's Grotto. In real life, you can find just the right present using the most advanced search engine in the world. Your eyes. We can't in real life. Brent Cross London. Free parking for all sleighs and cars. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. The nights have started to draw in. And at DFS, we know that can only mean one thing. Everyone's spending more time at home getting nice and cosy. Ah, you can't beat it. That's why our autumn winter collection sofas are handmade to order for complete comfort. And many are guaranteed to be delivered in time for Christmas. So make sure you come home to a sofa that's perfect for you. DFS. Guaranteed Christmas delivery and selected sofas end soon. At Lidl, we're big on all those Christmas parties. The season to be jolly. Try our party time Indian snack selection for only $2.99. And our party time mac and cheese bites for just $1.19. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes an eye. You're stuck indoors waiting for a delivery. But you should be at the match. You want to be home when the kids get back from school. Hey, guys. <sighs> but you've got to work late. <laughs> Again. With Ring Video Doorbell, you can do both. Featuring HD video and two-way talk, you can see, hear, and speak to whoever's at your door from wherever you are, all on your phone. Available at ring.com and selected retailers. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. This is Brian Musburger. Search the Better Network. That's the B-E-T-R network. And then let us get you better prepared to better enjoy the day in sports. The NFL, college football, basketball, hockey, baseball. Sharpen your edge. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Be better informed. Be better prepared. Search the Better Network. That's B-E-T-R. Welcome back to Naples, Florida. Our next guest betting big on a return of volatility as the markets make the turn into December. Mike Harris is president of Campbell & Company, a multi-strategy hedge fund 
based in Baltimore. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, like Scott. We, we have this conversation annually. It's good to catch up with you. You as well. A return of volatility. Terry Duffy does as well. Why? Why do you see that? Well, I mean, if you look at the averages across multiple asset classes, volatility continues to fall in recent weeks. Um, couple that with a, a rising environment of uncertainty, as we've heard from several of the other guests today, and uh, frankly, a lot of people at this conference. We've got two major macro themes that are going to come to a head in the next couple of weeks. One is, will we get phase one of that U.S.-China trade deal? Um, recently, we've heard you know optimism about that, but that could change you know in a second. And then on the flip side, you've got the the U.K. election coming in uh, you know the first sec- two weeks of December, and there's going to be a lot of implications around Brexit on the back of that. So I, I think there's a lot of people who have had a good year, and it's very possible that uh, they've got their finger on the sell button and they may take some profits if we start to see some uh, you know a spike in volatility in December. Are you positioned? for that? Are you looking for a decline in well, stocks? Well, we've got several defensive trades on in, in the portfolio. Um, you know, We're short energies, we're long precious metals like gold and silver, which obviously would get a nice pop if we saw a rise in volatility and sell off in stocks. We're also short a basket of emerging market currencies versus the dollar. Uh, we continue to be long global equities, but some of our faster, shorter term models, uh, we believe could probably get us out of that trade um, if we started to see that, that rise in vol. Just to be clear, I mean, you're a quantitative hedge fund for people who may not know what, what Campbell does. You have about three and a half billion under management. Is that right? Correct. So, I mean, the, the, the trend, though, feels like it's higher for equities, does it not? Yeah, absolutely. So some of our moment, longer term momentum strategies are going to be following uh, equities higher. Uh, but the whole point of being a multi-strat fund is that you blend quantitative macro models that are looking at economic data. Um, you blend shorter term strategies to help you be more nimble when markets tend to turn. I mean, I think what's really interesting on the macro side is, is and you've mentioned this in, in your show already, is central bank easing. Uh, two of our best trades this year were in Australia and Europe, where we were long the stock and bond markets, we were short the currency, and we were taking advantage of that easing on the back of the global weakness we saw as a result of the trade wars. Um, we don't have that trade on here in the U.S., though. We do believe that the Fed will continue to stay on hold and be data dependent. It's entirely possible that we see some more easing next year. Uh, but I think much to uh, the chagrin of President Trump, we will probably not see an easing here by year end. But doesn't, and I, I asked this of Mr. Duffy as well, I mean, having that in your back pocket is powerful, though. Is it not the Fed needs to become more engaged? It's going to get more engaged. I, I think all central banks will get more engaged if, if we see a pickup in the decline. And that's why, once again, I take it back to particularly the trade war. Um, that's why that macro event is going to be so important to see whether or not things are getting better or are they getting worse. Uh, there's there's entire there's an entire possibility that the the Chinese decide maybe they want to negotiate with either a new president or the same president after the 2020 election. So uh, we'll have to see what what comes about in December. You you say you're looking for a return of volatility in December, but you're not you're not looking for a return of the kind of December we had last year, are you? I, I don't a, a think big it's swoosh. I don't think it's going to be as as dramatic as what we saw um, last December. Uh, but once again. Uh, there are a lot of people that have made a good amount of money this year, and I think it's entirely possible that those people are going to start to take some of the profits off the table, lock in those gains um, at the first sign of, of an issue in the marketplace. Yeah. There's also the likelihood of, uh, or at least the possibility, I should probably say, of a chase, of a performance chase that, that counters sort of some of the profit-taking. But we'll, we'll see. Good to see you again. You as well. Right. Thanks. Mike Harris, again, the president of Campbell & Company, joining us down here. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk to the traders back in our headquarters for final trade straight ahead. Sundown Vitamins are all non-GMO. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10 p.m. on Friday the 22nd of November to 5 a.m. on Monday the 25th of November while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit. With our award-winning eight-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just $12.99. And our award-winning range of Hortus Artis and Gins and Gin Liqueurs from only $9.99. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes an eye. This Black Friday, get Sky Entertainment for £22 a month, then feel it all with a spectacular 50% off Sky Sports. If 
including the Manchester Derby and the darts. Build your perfect bundle today. Choose any or all of our Sky TV packages and get an incredible 50% off. Hurry, join today. Visit sky.com. Offer end 2nd of December. New 18 month minimum terms or 31 days notice to cancel depending on package. Discount on standard pricing with same minimum terms. Set up £25. Kit allowed at no cost. College football is live on TV. Listen for free to games from more than 140 schools all season long. To the 10, all the way to the checkerboard. Somebody stays on his feet and scores. Number two, Ohio State looks to clinch the Big Ten Eastern title division outright and a spot in the Big Ten Conference Championship game as they host the ninth-ranked Penn State Nittany Lions in Columbus. This Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern, listen to every call and every game of your school all season long for free on TuneIn. Penn State at Ohio State. Just search college to listen today you love tune in for live breaking news from cnn msnbc fox cnbc and more but when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs it might just be a click away as a podcast search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on tune in welcome back to the conference down here in Naples, Florida, back at our headquarters, the investment committee is standing by. Joe Terranova, Stephanie Link, Jim Labenthal, John Najarian. Guys, it's a retail kind of a day, right? Those are the stocks we want to talk about. Depot's under pressure, Macy's, Kohl's. Stephanie Link, what catches your eye today? Uh, well, Home Depot wasn't as bad, and Kohl's was wor- way worse. <laughs> that's, that's my uh, summary, quickly. Anyway, Home Depot, actually, it's at its all-time high, or it was, and expectations were so high, at 22 times forward estimates, it had to be a perfect print, and it wasn't. But underneath the surface, that 3-6 comp, if you adjust for currency and lumber and an event shift that happened year over year, they actually did 4.8 in a comp, and that's pretty good. It was very close to expectations. The implied guidance is a five comp, and I feel pretty good about that. So it's it's not down enough for me to buy or add to it, but it is something that I will watch and I will look to buy if it does continue to fall. I think Kohl's is an absolute mess, no matter what they do in terms of Amazon, private label, the loyalty card, across the board, Just it, it's just not driving traffic, and that's a real problem for them. Uh, I'm having flashbacks, though, Steph, to, you know, you talking about, say, a McDonald's or a Disney and looking at the runs that those stocks had and lightening up your positions, in fact, selling out of of McDonald's altogether, wondering whether you wish you would have done the same thing with a Home Depot after what you mentioned was a run to an all-time high. I mean, I just think that duopoly with Lowe's and Home Depot is unique to them. And so I think this management is great. I do still think that there's margin upside for them. But as I say, I mean, 22 times is not cheap. You're absolutely spot on. But I don't want to give up on it, especially with rates where they are in housing. The permits numbers today were really quite good. And I think we're going to see a recovery in housing. So that's a theme I still like. Hey Doc, what are you watching today? What, what's catching your eye on on a day where we've you know we're down Dow's down ninety or so? Uh, Scott, uh, discounters. I mean, take a look at TJ Maxx. You were on with Steph just now about retailers. Uh, TJ Maxx new fifty two week high today. Scott Ross stores is just that far from another fifty two week high. So I love both of those, um, and I'm seeing a lot of activity uh, in some. Uh, retailer uh, that's in the uh, pet space, Chewy, C-H-W-Y, Scott. This one I would have done for unusual activity today because they were buying the Dece 22 and a half calls. Big numbers there, really big. And the stock's moving up. It's a surrogate for owning that stock, like the trade, and it's December. I'd probably be in that about a month, Scott. All right, let me make sure people know that was your unusual activity for the day. Thank you yes, for sir. squeezing that in, Doc. Sure. We appreciate that. How about you, Joe? Market bounces back once again after Home Depot's earnings. If there was a reason for the market to go down, certainly Home Depot gave it to investors this morning. Masco, building materials, that's a secondary trade off of the weakness in Home Depot. I'm out of Masco. I think that's an area of concern. To John's point on TJX, I purchased that today. Consumers, fine, especially if you're looking at off-price. The market is enjoying today a nice blend of growth and value, both working, financials, healthcare, and, of course, technology once once again. So critical to the comments of the last few days, I think the chase for performance and the higher move continues. Jimmy, let me ask you your reaction to what you heard from Mike Harris and Terry Duffy about this expectation of a return of volatility between now and the end of the year when, you know, frankly, we've largely been talking about whether it's a chase for performance or the trend feels like it's higher. How do those counteract one another? What do you see? 
Well, conceptually, what they're saying makes sense, but empirically, you just look at how the markets are behaving right now. They're behaving really well, despite the fact that we've gotten wobbly on trade. And that should be the catalyst for volatility, and it isn't. So I think you got to take the easiest, most simple uh, explanation, which is that low volatility is going to continue through the end of the year. That's the, that's the path of least resistance. Higher markets, lower volatility. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. That's what makes a market, right? I mean, you have differing points of view on where things may head from here. We do have uh, about a minute or so left. Guys, let's do final trades, if we could, before we go. Steph, why don't you start us off today? So Stanley Black and Decker on the Home Depot and Lowe's themes for sure. The stock is down in sympathy, and I think it's a great opportunity. They've done enormous restructuring, almost $1.80 in earnings of restructuring. So I think they're positioned well for next year, and I like the M&A strategy as well. Dr. J. Scorpio Tankers, Judge, STNG. A lot of upside call buying in this one yesterday and today. All right, Joe, what do you got for me? Scott, TJX is already up there, so I'll give you MasterCard and PayPal growth is coming back. All right, Jim, finally you. Uh, CVS continues to do well despite political pressures. I like it a lot. All right, guys, I look forward to seeing all of you back on the desk tomorrow up there. That does it for us from here in Naples, Florida. The exchange begins right now. Thanks, Scott. Uh, welcome to the exchange. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin in for Kelly Evans. Here is what is ahead today. Tech hitting a 10-year high, even as profits for the sector decline. And technicals say we are way now overbought. Is a bubble forming? That's the question. Plus, the consumer may be strong, but that doesn't mean everyone benefits. So look at the haves and the have-nots in retail as Home Depot and, Co and Kohl's get crushed. And it looks like Slack's competition is catching up and investors are taking some note. Uh, but we begin today with uh, markets. Sim Modi's got the numbers. Andrew hey. Ross Sorkin, good afternoon. Great nice to, see to see you, you. in-house. It's 1 p.m. Yeah. Eastern, a little bit later. Now, now, can I walk over and say hi to you, or is that, how does this we work? We can do whatever you want. You okay. are anchoring the show, Andrew. I'm going to stay out of the camera zone, though. You keep, go you keep going. You got it. Here we go, 1 p.m. Eastern. Here is where markets stand right now. Stocks are pulling back from record highs right now, with the exception of the NASDAQ, which is still outperforming here, up about three-tenths of 1%. A lot of that having to do with this rebound that we've been seeing in a number of chip makers. But as Andrew was alluding to, a lot of weakness in the retail sector. Remember, this is the week where we hear from a number of retail companies, both Home Depot and Kohl's, cutting their full year forecast. Those stocks responding. Kohl's down now uh, nearly 19 percent. Home Depot lower by 5 percent. That's weighing on the broader retail sector. Now we await results from Nordstrom after the bell. Another theme that we've been watching, just taking a step back, is uh, the outperformance in global stocks so far this quarter. In fact, Germany, you'll see Russia, and even the banks in Europe uh, responding nicely to a weaker dollar, as well as uh, better than expected earnings from some of the major banks in Europe, plus trade optimism and those concerns of a Brexit also calming down. You can see Germany up 18 percent, vastly outperforming the out but vastly outperforming stocks here in the U.S. Andrew, sending it back to you. Okay, Seema, thank you for that. As the markets continue to hit new highs, tech has been a big standout, and questions are arising about whether it's getting a bit frothy. Listen to these stats. Tech stocks are on pace now for their best year since 2009, up 41%. That gain coming despite the sector posting a steep decline in profits in the third quarter, down 5.3%. Nearly one in three fund managers right now say it is the most crowded trade out there, and the RSI, a key technical indicator of overbought conditions, is now at levels that are almost never seen. Joining us to discuss and debate it all, Paul Meeks is here, the portfolio manager of the Wireless Fund, and Neil Hennessy, who I should really say is here physically at the desk, chief investment officer of Hennessy Funds. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I'm a squat guy. It's, it's midday now. Um, Neil, you're with us uh, here. You think we're a little long in the tooth. I don't think the market's long in the tooth. I think that when you look at technology that it could be long in the tooth, but there's still a lot of tech companies out there that are overlooked. Okay. I'll give you a classic example. You can look at Microsoft and you can buy that at on a price to sales ratio of nine to one, so you're paying nine dollars for a dollar in revenue. Or you can buy NCR, the old national cash register right. company, kiosks, you know, scanners, and you buy that for 0.6 or 60 cents on the dollar. So there's a lot of companies, iTron, there's a lot of companies outside of what people focus on in technology. Okay, so outside out of the there. fangs. We always talk tech, tech people exactly. invariably, they think, of, they think of the fangs. Correct. And you're thinking much more in the sort of older classic enterprise world, it sounds like. Value. 
value. Right. And there's still a lot of value in tech, but you get those five companies and they run everything. But, you know, once somebody decides to exit the door, they're all going the same way, especially with the index funds. There's nothing they can do but sell at right. the market. Hey, Paul, what do you think here? I mean, there is a sense that this has been going on for quite some time. The multiples have gotten rich. You know, is there an argument to, uh, to, to take some of the profits and, uh, and go to dinner? I actually think there's a pretty good argument for that. I don't know if I would necessarily shift into some of these 80s and 90s style hardware-oriented companies because I don't think that they're values at any price. But when you take a look at the overall tech sector, you said in the intro, 41% year-to-date, which is outrageously uh, good. However, I would tell you something that whenever the tech stock performance is quoted, they're typically using the performance for the XLK, which is the best-known ETF, the tech stocks within the S&P 500. What a lot of folks don't know that even though there are 68 stocks that make up that ETF, two of them, only two of them, Microsoft right. and Apple, make up 40% of the weight. So that index is essentially not representative tech. It's essentially the Microsoft and Apple fund. Okay. And I'll so you have to be laser beam focused at those stocks are uh, what you want, and they're going to continue to have 2020s like they had 2019s. And you're saying they aren't? I think Microsoft is pretty solid, though I do agree that it's uh, a bit expensive. Apple, I think, over the next year might be the stock with the run that it's had where there might be some hell to pay. Okay. I mean, the way I look at Apple is their hardware business is slowing, and they're getting to EPS growth only through huge stock buybacks, which can't continue indefinitely. Okay, Neil, I give you 10 grand. I can make it interesting. I give you 100 grand. Yeah. You only buy one stock in this space. What are you doing? Oh, just one stock? Just if one. Was, it'd be Exxon. I've always said Exxon because they're going to be here forever. Okay, that's not in the technology space? Oh, in tech. In, uh, in, 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 in this in, land. In this land, I'd, I'd say NCR. I think it's just cash flowing out. It doesn't pay a dividend. It earns two twenty. It's got a low price to sales. I know it's old and stodgy, Andrew, but that's where you really make right. money long term. Paul, I give you a hundred grand. I know, you know, I know you need a million or, or, or probably ten to, to manage my money. But uh, if you could only buy one stock, you buy what? I'd buy the wireless fund. If I couldn't buy the wireless fund, I'd put fifty in applied materials and fifty in micron technology. Okay, we will uh, take that to the bank, and we will see uh, where it gets us. Paul Meeks and Neil Hennessy, thank you uh, both. Uh, thank you. We should tell you, uh, many will say that uh, more than any other factor, consumer spending has been the driver of growth in the U.S., but when it comes to retail, it turns out people are picky about where they shop. This year's Kohl's and Gap have now dropped over 30%. Macy's has plummeted more than 50% at this point, but some retailers are uh, they're still rocking it. Uh, Best Buy in general, uh, and Dollar General, I should say, have jumped over 40% uh, just alone in 2019, while Target is soaring. Those shares are up 67% already. Here to drill down on the split in the sector, GBS retail analyst uh, Michael Lasser. Michael, uh, good to see you. Uh, we're going to be hearing from good Target. Talk, talking about Target, we're going to be hearing from Target tomorrow. Um, I don't know if you have any uh, expectations about where that lands, and then I want to get into what happened with uh, HD, with, uh, with Home Depot today. Absolutely. For Target tomorrow, they're going to do better than a four comp. They're going to see at least 40 to 50 basis points of gross margin expansion, and their earnings are going to be now, the question is, uh, is... Is that really built into the stock, though? That, yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's really about expectations at this point. And that's what's anticipated. So for the stock to move higher, it's got to do something better than that and show it's got momentum into the holidays, which the most likely case is that it will. Okay, now tell me about uh, Home Depot. Uh, that, that, those numbers crossed this morning. The market did not like it. They were unhappy. The question, of course, is we also got lows, by the way, coming as well. Uh, yeah. But... Um, the other piece of this is, was the HD situation a, uh, a Home Depot-specific situation, or do you look at that situation and say, okay, uh, there's something else going on here with the consumer, with housing? This is a Home Depot-specific uh, situation, but it's not about execution. Ho Home Depot's execution continues to be very strong. This is a Home Depot expectations issue. It just so happened that the expectations had gotten ahead of themselves and, and a lot was priced into the stock. They said that uh, the their strategies are materializing or the benefits of their strategies are materializing a little bit more slowly than they anticipated. And as a result, the stock's pulling back. 
nothing fundamentally has changed about the story. This still is one of the best run retailers on the planet, and over the long run, that's going to produce a very solid return for shareholders. Okay, the stock's down 12% today. You buy it? Uh, I think it's just down in mid single digit range, and I absolutely would buy it. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, would, I'm sorry, it's down five percent. I believe it was twelve, 12 yeah. points. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, no, no, no worries. I would absolutely buy Lowe's into the print tomorrow. I think what we heard from Home Depot is that the home improvement market is stable, seasonal, which Lowe's over indexes to did particularly well. And I would also point out that Lowe's trades at a meaningful discount to Home Depot here. Estimates are like more likely to rise than they are to fall, and that's going to drive the stock price right. higher over the next 12 months. So we would be buyers of lows at this level unequivocally. What do you make of just the fact that some of the other retailers got killed today on this news? I think there's a, wi- yeah, I think there's a widening gap between those well-positioned retailers and all of the rest for three reasons. Those good retailers are making it easier for us as consumers to do business with them. They're taking friction out of the process. As an example, you can go to the Home Depot app and they'll tell you exactly where within a store a product is located. Two, they have the products that we want at the price points that are compelling. And three, they're gobbling up market share from the likes of those retailers that are going away. Those three conditions are not going to change anytime soon. Okay, Michael Astor, thank you. Good to see you. Uh, thank we you. will see what those, uh, what those prints look like tomorrow. Uh, meantime, we've got a news alert uh, on Boeing, and we're going to get to Phil LeBeau, who's got that story. Phil, what's going on? Boeing is out with a statement following the NTSB recommendations regarding an incident on a Southwest Airlines plane in April of last year. You'll remember, a lot of people will remember that this was the incident where there was an uncontained engine failure. And as a result, one of the fan blades blades then went into the fuselage, blew out a a window. A passenger was partially sucked out of that window. That passenger later uh, passed away. What the NTSB is saying, there have to be changes made to the engines in these 737NG models. That's the variation of the 737 before the MAX. After uh, this uh, release from the NTSB, Boeing out with a statement saying it is committed to working closely with the FAA, engine manufacturers, and industry stakeholders to implement enhancements that address the NTSB's safety recommendations. Those engines, by the way, Andrew, manufactured by CFM International. That's a joint venture between GE Aviation and Saffron. They inspected a lot of the engine blades following that incident. Well, now the NTSB is saying, look, you've got to do a better job, everybody involved here, specifically with these Boeing models of working on the inlet and the fan cowl so there are no uh, uncontained engine failures in the future. Andrew, back to you. Okay, another Boeing day, another day, another Boeing headline. Phil, thank you, though, uh, for that. Yeah. Uh, here's, what, uh, is El- here's what's ahead on the exchange. Coming up, forward-looking. That's one of the CFTC's new mottos as it looks to the future of trading. We'll talk to the chairman about his plans to make America the leader when it comes to crypto. Plus, why Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax could have some public companies consider going private and may lead the wealthy to shift away from owning stocks. And two big private companies, DoorDash and WeWork, are in hot water with the law. This is The Exchange on CNBC. It was Sophie's big day. I love Black Friday. Busy shops, crazy people, average deals. It's so much fun. (laughs) Said no one ever. So be savvy and do Black Friday the easy way with Smarty. Grab a huge 100 gig data sim for just £17 a month on the Mega Plan. And with no credit checks, speed restrictions or contracts tying you down, you can kick back with the best Black Friday deal around. Now that's Smarty. Search Smarty Mobile to find out more. But hurry, as this deal won't be around for long. See smarty.co.uk for terms. Christmas is such a magical time of year for little ones. But why should the big kids miss out? This season, take the family to Santa's Wonderland at West London Audi. You get to test drive the latest Audi models, and the children get to test drive the latest toys with Santa. There's something for the whole family. Visit santaswonderlab.com to find out more about how to register for your place at Santa's Wonderlab this Christmas. 
Ladies and gentlemen, behold the world's most fantastical, sensational number. 105 million. Tonight's Euro Millions jackpot is a massive 105 million pounds. Euro Millions, celebrating 25 years of the National Lottery. Your numbers make amazing happen. Estimated jackpot. Rules and procedures apply. Players must be 16 or over. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit. With our award-winning eight-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just $12.99. And our award-winning range of Hortus Artisan and Gins and Gin Liqueurs from only $9.99. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes an eye. At Tui. We can help you find the perfect getaway for two. We fly to over 70 destinations worldwide, so wherever you have in mind, we'll help you get there. Book now and choose from thousands of holidays under 399 per person and pay zero pounds deposit when paying with direct debit. Book online or in store with one of our travel experts. At TUI, we cross the T's, dot the I's and put you in the middle. Offer available on selected holidays for a limited time and subject to availability. Booking T's and C's apply. At all protected. In the stock market and in life, everything can change from one minute to the next. Be the first to hear the latest money news and market trends with CNBC on TuneIn. Wherever your day takes you, listen to CNBC's full slate of programming, including shows like Fast Money, Squawk Box, and Mad Money with Jim Cramer. And when the next big business story breaks, CNBC lets you know with live updates and commentary. At the office, at home, or on the go. Search CNBC on TuneIn to listen. Welcome back to uh, The Exchange. Presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren went after former Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein in a TV ad promoting her wealth tax. Lloyd responded on Twitter that while she's not his candidate, they do align on many issues, but that the vilification of people as a group is not good for the country. Scott Wapner got a chance to sit down with Mr. Blankfein just a couple of moments ago and got his take on that wealth tax. I can understand where the wealth tax is coming from. You know, that's a very good way to, again, share the rewards, share the fruits, which you can also achieve through a progressive tax system, which affects only income. If you don't realize income, you're not touched by it. An estate tax at the end of death would accomplish the same thing. I understand where it's coming from. I understand the goals. The problem with it is it's completely unworkable. Forget about the constitutionality. Where it's been attempted, it's hard. To settle an estate often you know, could take many years to settle a state. How do you mark to market your entire wealth every year? Farmers who own farms, people who own, cl- who owned, uh, who own homes. It's not just fancy people with tens of millions of dollars worth of art collections. It's anybody with a farm or a home would have to establish what that home was worth every year. You'd spend years fighting about it, and next year you'd have to do it again. For more on the wealth tax debate, want to bring in Robert Shapiro, founder and chairman of Economic Advisors from Sonicon. Uh, he has also served as economic advisor to the past five Democratic nominees for president and CNBC wealth editor. I'm calling you Roberto Frank. So Sounds we keep good. the Roberto and the Robert separate then. <laughs> so I'm going to go to Robert first. Though. Um, is a wealth tax feasible? We just heard from Lloyd Blankfein, who said it just it, even if it's a good idea, it doesn't work. Well, um, it's not feasible in the terms that Senator Warren has presented. Uh, and Blankfein is right about the basic reason, and that is in order to have a fair tax, you have to accurately know the value of the asset. And the only assets that are marked to market are uh, shares in publicly right. traded companies. However, He's wrong about the issue of homes and farms. The fact is that the Warren tax exempts the first $50 million in assets. So that's not really an issue. The real issue is that half the economy, half of employment and more than half of all businesses are privately held. I mean, you know, we're talking... Bechtel right. and, and how are you going to value them? Young, and how do you value them? You can't value them. Right. Um, you can have a wealth tax, but not on the stock of wealth, but rather on the flow of wealth. Right. Hey, Robert, uh, I, mean, I got to go to the other Roberto for just one second. I apologize, Robert. I'm going to Roberto right, now. Right, right. Um, just help us with this. You've spent a lot of time looking at wealth taxes that have been implemented in other countries. Yeah. And you have argued, uh, at least that I have seen, that they don't work. 
They haven't in Europe. Why? So there used to be, well, there used to be 12 countries in Europe that had them. Now it's only three, and, and it's probably going to be less than that in a couple of years. The, the issue isn't so much valuation, although that's part of it. The two issues why it didn't work in Europe is, number one, they started at a very low threshold. So they started at maybe $100,000, $200,000. Well, Warren answers that by, to Robert's point. They started $50 million. The second reason is that in Europe, it's very easy to move from one country to another because there's now open borders. Right. In the U.S., that would be harder. I think what Lloyd was making the point, which I think was really interesting, yes, we have a problem with the allocation of wealth, but the very production of wealth, we shouldn't see successful billionaires and successful CEOs as policy right. mistakes, right. which is what the Warren camp well, is and, saying. And, but that's the question I would ask Robert, given that you are, you have historically advised other Democrats. You know, uh, the New York Times, Neil Irwin had a piece where he described this wealth tax as a cigarette tax. That it's actually, unlike, unlike most taxes, which are effectively there to raise revenue, this is something that's not only there to raise revenue, but over time, it's actually supposed to do something very different, which is supposed to effectively disincentivize and actually reduce the amount of money that people have in the same way that uh, it, the cigarette tax reduces the amount of people who use cigarettes. Well, um, I think that's probably correct for a 6% wealth tax. But don't forget that we also have tax preferences for income which is highly concentrated among wealthy people, which is all the preferences for capital income. Right. And so you would look at that, that would be subject to but the same criticism. But why aren't we talking about those things? I mean, that's the real question. Why are we not talking about capital gains? You know, uh, Lloyd talked about the estate tax. Mm -hmm. I can talk to you about uh, carried interest. I could talk to you about 1031 exchanges. Because it Why doesn't... are those things not... By the way, if we solved those things, which are like the low-hanging fruit, yeah. plus if you actually spent some money on the receivables issue, which is actually the IRS actually collecting the money that they're supposed to receive, I think we would have a very different discussion in this country. The word step-up basis doesn't become a campaign slogan that rallies people in the field, in a big arena, when you have a campaign uh, situation. Whereas two cents... Shouldn't the billionaires pay two cents? That gets people fired up. And I think that's the bottom line. Lloyd's point was, look, a better estate tax, eliminating step up, up. Yep. doing all these things that you and I talk about every morning and that are the obvious solutions that could, by the way, raise more revenue yep. than a wealth tax, just aren't <laughs> sexy on the campaign Okay, let's trip. bring it finally. Uh, you get the final word, Robert. Why do the Democrats not go after that? Well, I think some Democrats are going after that. Those who say we should tax capital gains at the same rate as labor income. Uh, and indeed, we could get a, a pretty good semblance of a wealth tax if we did that and tax the gains on an annual basis, whether realized or not, which would be to treat, um, treat uh, uh, capital gains the right. same way we treat mutual funds today. And you would raise a lot of money, and it would be an in effect, wealth tax. Okay. Uh, Robert Shapiro and Roberto Frank, thank you <laughs> so very much for this conversation. Uh, coming up when we return, his agency is taking the lead on regulating cryptocurrencies. He's also taking the lead on revising what he calls the most poorly designed regulation in the history of American finance. We're going to talk about all of it with the CFTC chairman live. That's straight ahead. Plus, what American Express is offering businesses to take its card as it hopes to catch up to the competition. We've got the details. The exchange is back in two minutes. Deeper data at CNBC. Shipping container volumes through the ports of Seattle and Tacoma fell 7.2% in October from the same month a year ago. The trade war with China is blamed for the drop. This is the investing book. On three, our unlimited data is actually unlimited, like four reels. That means you can scroll and scroll and scroll through all the Black Friday deals. Because we have no speed limits, no data caps, and you'll be 5G ready at no extra cost. Wow, so many savings. Our Black Friday deals are now on. Save up to £480. Switch to three, in-store or online. See 3.co.uk forward slash unlimited dash data. Savings on selected phones on 24-month contracts. Ends 5th of December. Terms apply. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November. 
while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit with our award-winning eight-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just $12.99 and our award-winning range of Hortus Artisan gins and gin liqueurs from only $9.99. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes an eye. The nights have started to draw in. And at DFS, we know that can only mean one thing. Everyone's spending more time at home getting nice and cosy. Ah, you can't beat it. That's why our autumn winter collection sofas are handmade to order for complete comfort. And many are guaranteed to be delivered in time for Christmas. So make sure you come home to a sofa that's perfect for you. DFS. Guaranteed Christmas delivery and selected sofas end soon. Whether you call yourself a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or something else, the road to 2020 is on tune in. Oh, what a it, night! It, and, and a complete earthquake. This was Follow earthquake. every step of the Democratic primaries while hearing the latest headlines from the White House with live 24-hour news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox News Talk, and more. We're closing in on the first results in the battle for the White House. It is Experience be- the election through the sources you trust with the nonstop news channels on TuneIn. Welcome back to The Exchange. Uh, Public impeachment hearings continuing on Capitol Hill today with a morning and afternoon session. Elon Mui is live on Capitol Hill with the very latest. Elon. Well, Andrew, lawmakers are wrapping up their first round of hearings. They're nearing the end. And if Republicans have kept up the pressure on Alexander Vindman, that national security official, to explain who he told about that July 25th phone call, while Vindman categorically denies ever sharing sensitive information. And, Colonel, you never leaked information? I never did, never would. That is, uh, that is preposterous that I would do that. Meanwhile, President Trump told reporters during a cabinet meeting that these hearings are a kangaroo court. He said he did watch some of the testimony this morning, and he's been retweeting about it in just the past few minutes. Democrats, for their part, have tried to stay focused on the fact that both of the witnesses this morning listened in on that July 25th phone call. Both of them found it unusual. And Andrew Vindman repeatedly said that he thought it was improper, inappropriate, and could potentially undermine U.S. policy in Ukraine. Back over to you. Okay, thank you for that, Elon. Uh, now over to Rahel Solomon for a CNBC News update. Rahel. Hi, Andrew. Hey. Hello, everyone. And here's what's happening at this hour. The Taliban in Afghanistan releasing an American and Australian hostage they held for more than three years. The two men, Kevin King and Timothy Weeks, are university professors. They were kidnapped in August 2016 from outside the American University of Afghanistan and Kabul. A gas explosion inside a coal mine in northern China, killing 15 miners and injuring nine more. The blast occurred on Monday, but rescue work was stopped early this morning after everyone was accounted for. More than 140 schools are closed across Indiana as thousands of teachers travel to Indianapolis to protest low teacher pay. So according to the state superintendent of public instruction, Indiana ranks 50 out of the 50 states in teacher pay increases since 2002. And you can expect to pay a little more this year for your Christmas tree. Climate conditions have hampered tree growth. And some of the nation's biggest tree growing states like Oregon and North Carolina with many trees being much smaller than in years past. And that is the CNBC News of the update at this hour. Andrew, I'll send it back to you. Rahel, thank you for that. Here's what else is coming up on The Exchange. Ahead, American Express is paying up big time to make sure every retailer is on board. WeWork may be facing a new lawsuit. A serial entrepreneur tells us the secret to building a successful company. And is DoorDash pocketing tips? It's all coming up on The Exchange. Do you have concerns about... Let me ask you, when do you believe you get the best deals? Black Friday? Uh, Why wait? The best deals are now at Carphone Warehouse. Save an amazing 60 pounds on the Samsung Galaxy A40. Just $14.99 a month. How about a Vodafone SIM-only deal for an incredible 15 pounds a month with 10 gig of data? Get great deals today without the wait at Carphone Warehouse. 
Samsung A40 on select 24 month contracts. Sim Vodafone on select 18 month contracts. T's and C's apply. Visit website for more details. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10 p.m. on Friday the 22nd of November to 5 a.m. on Monday the 25th of November while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Christmas is such a magical time of year for little ones. But why should the big kids miss out? This season, take the family to Santa's Wonder Lab at West London Audi. You get to test drive the latest Audi models, and the children get to test drive the latest toys with Santa. There's something for the whole family. Visit santaswonderlab.com to find out more about how to register for your place at Santa's Wonder Lab this Christmas. Coffee shop, cash back, cat flaps, cash back, bean bags, rucksack, hire car, buy a car, flapjack, cash back, dumbbells, cash back, takeaway, holiday to anywhere the sun is at, bum bag, laptop, big match, hatchback, binge watching, paintballing, crab fishing, cash back, anything you want to buy, everywhere you want to go, guess what? Cash back. Whatever you spend your money on, get money back every time with the American Express Platinum Cashback Everyday Credit Card. Search Amex Cashback. Representative 22.9% APR variable. Minimum annual spend to receive cashback. Terms apply. 18 plus subject to approval. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit. With our award-winning eight-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just $12.99. And our award-winning range of Hortus Artisan gins and gin liqueurs from only $9.99. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Price. Subject to availability, selected stores, excludes an eye. Should we go halves? I'll get this. Let me just get my card. Which was in my pocket. Um, you can't control awkward first dates. But if you temporarily misplace your debit card, you can freeze and unfreeze it on our mobile banking app. Feeling control every day. Lloyd's Bank, by your side. You can only freeze some transaction types. T's and C's apply. <laughs> Welcome back to The Exchange. We're want to catch up on a few, much more interesting conversation we can without do it. We're, we're going to talk about the Navaj, yeah. which is you you use up and up for your nose. Yeah. You have a cold. I have a cold. It actually comes from India. But we've got a couple of other mm-hmm. stories. It's like a neti pot, but um, mm-hmm. more advanced. Uh, it is time for rapid fire. We can maybe get to the Navaj at the end or do a demo on Squawk tomorrow, which we may do. Uh, but in the meantime, <laughs> Leslie Picker is here. Bill Griffith is here. Seema Modi is here. We've got a handful of big stories to talk about. First topic, American Express has some catching up to do. In 2018, there were about 1.3 million businesses that took Visa and MasterCard, but not Amex. And American Express has set a goal now uh, of the end of this year to close that gap, and they are willing to pay plenty to do it. Amex salespeople are paying bonuses with little to no conditions uh, directly to businesses, ranging from $10,000 to $450,000. Is this a good idea or not? They still haven't gotten over the uh, loss of the Costco contract, have they? Well, that's, a, that's a whole that separate four issue. Years ago. Well, I mean, that, that was a big loss of business. But here they are them. giving out these big contracts. Right? I don't know if you saw, yeah. in some cases, it'll take them six, seven years to get the payback. Right. And it all comes down to swipe fees at the end of the day, because if you're a business, right. uh, you know, and the swipe fees are expensive for Amex relative to its competitors, uh, you may just say, you know, listen, I'm a small business. I can't really afford these right now. I'm not really getting the benefit from right. your Amex customers. And for some people, the, the bonuses don't really... How much have have you had any experience with this, Seema? <laughs> well, sure he asked, we, knowing the answer already. Well, Bill, I'm sure we all have friends that want... I'm not, I'm not an Amex holder, but I certainly have a couple of those friends. You take them to a cool hipster spot in the Lower East Side. It's time to pay the bill. Right. And then when you're about to split the check, the owner says, we don't accept Amex. So there's certainly an opportunity here for right. them to win some more business how much, and go, get more businesses How much up. of this, though, is the function of the fact that Visa and MasterCard now depending on who the issuer is, mm. actually offer real benefits right. that they never did before. Right. Exactly. That, that was the value add for Amex historically, and that's right. why you would see you know, wealthier customers sign up for Amex because they'd be willing to pay whatever it is, $400 a year for a card, right. in exchange for some of these benefits. Okay. I do want so, to say the best feature, though, mm-hmm. on a platinum Amex card is the insurance feature. Emergency, yes. if you have a problem in another country, they will literally medevac you out 
Our family had it, and I'll tell you, they saved us. So wow. it was fabulous. There you are. Plus, wow. we get, have it. every year at the uh, U.S. Open Tennis Open, we get free headphones yes. with our Amex card, too. So. That, and those little that's, incentives, that's, the hotels little, and travel operators, benefit. too. Yes. There's big um, partnerships there. But if you travel, that, that insurance thing is worth yeah, that's every, every penny. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, topic two on our list. More problems for WeWork. The company telling CNBC that it has now received an inquiry from the office of the New York State Attorney General's office and is cooperating with the matter. The subject of that inquiry is not known at the time. The New York AG would not confirm or deny to CNBC that there is an actual investigation taking place. Is this just to be expected? I think it's to be expected. Absolutely. I think it's. I mean, it follows the SEC is investigating right. this company. New York Attorney General is investigating this company. Now, of course, no charges have been filed yet. We don't know exactly what they're investigating um, per se. But anytime you see a situation like this where there's been just this tremendous loss of value, you can expect the regulators right. to say, oh, wait, we're awake. We're paying attention to this. Even though so many of the issues were... Known for I mean, this was Adam years. Newman's piggy bank, uh, and he was taking advantage of the company even before the IPO was coming along. We know the stories about uh, uh, buying buildings right. and renting it back to the company, charging six million dollars for his patented we, <coughs> right. and they named the, the company the trademark we on company, we, yep. you know, all those things, which he then Some had people to think of self dealing. Right. Well, exactly. And that's it, the isn't that? But uh, is it illegal? That's, that's the question. The question. When, it, when you're a publicly traded company, that all of that's a no-no. And with all these concerns uh, adding up, you got to wonder what type of incentives Masayoshi Son has to provide, whoever this new CEO is going to be of WeWork, um, because clearly this is going to be a tough job and a tough company to navigate yeah, through all these various headwinds. Okay, so Masa now has something like $15 billion in the company? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Okay, what's the chance he gets it back? Anybody want to wager? I'm not raising my hand. No? It'll be know. a long time. You can put that on draft tables. Amex, Amex, yeah, yeah, Amex will catch Visa and MasterCard right, before first. he I gets mean, his money. If, okay. if he gets it back, Save I mean, the there's tape. no guarantee. Save the tape. Uh, <laughs> topic three on our list today, uh, Slack falling steeply after a new report from Webbush saying that Microsoft's Teams product, I don't know if you guys have used it, a direct competitor to Slack has 20 million daily active users. Slack reporting 12 million daily active users in its earnings statement in July. And Slack uh, stock down now over 9% and down about 50% from its all-time high of $42. We, we what use gives? Slack, we use we Slack here. Slack, we use Outlook. But I think we always knew that Microsoft was going to be the growing competitive threat to Slack's business case. Right. I think the other big challenge here is there's been a lot of Silicon Valley folks who are really pushing more companies towards a direct listing over an IPO. And Slack was really their case study, right? Their poster child of the direct listing model. But the story hasn't really worked out. You take a look at the stock. It hit an all-time high when it first went public at $42. Now it's trading about 50% below that level. So it really... Uh, doesn't really help the case for those who are pushing private companies to take right. the direct listing but route. really, this, this feels like a bragging match in the short term. And it, in the aggregate, what's it going to matter? I mean, they both are going to grow. I don't think, I don't Here's think, my I don't question. Think zero. Put on your, you, you your deal-maker you put on your deal sum game? Put on your deal maker I mean, eye shades. I have a question for you, yeah. M&A reporter. You. Which is, <laughs> you. you, do you think as the stock falls that somebody's going to come out of the woodwork and say, you know what, this thing's half of what it was worth before. Mm. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to integrate it into my enterprise, and I, that's the end of Maybe it's somebody that's answer. already got a messaging uh, service like that? Either somebody With who, a lot of cash on the, on the Either box? somebody who does. I mean, the question is, you from a regulatory a perspective, can they? Well, you bring up a good point, because with Microsoft, their big benefit here, and the reason that they've been able to surpass Slack so quickly is because they have this bundle right. idea. So the reason I say that it could be more of a zero-sum game is because, you know, if you can get the product for free on Microsoft, you know, through this Microsoft bundle... And you're, you know, maybe a free customer on Slack that ultimately becomes a paying customer. If there's some sort of a, you know, recession or you know, businesses aren't spending as much on technology, you're probably going to opt for the free option, right. you know, through this bundle. So maybe if you are Slack or if you are a, you know, I'm just a saying partner, if you're Google, you may and say, GChat's no longer uh, working the way it used to. Yeah, um, it's certainly a potential acquisition if target. If you're Apple, I would imagine and you want to get in, do more in the enterprise, I could see and a lot from, of things going on. And so, Slack could benefit from right. that because they'd be part of a bundle of a bigger company. Now, I'm not saying right. they would. There well, are ongoing discussions. Right. Do you own Cloud Shares, right? I believe so. so. Yeah, yeah. We so will know that it's your over. Friends can't get we will know that yeah. it's over for Slack when we convert to Teams. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Uh, topic four on our list: uh, Washington D.C.'s Attorney General suing DoorDash, accusing the company of keeping tips that were meant for workers and misleading customers about where all that money was going. DoorDash using a tip model where they guaranteed delivery workers a certain amount for delivery, but would then subsidize that guaranteed amount with tips paid by customers. The charge is saying this amounted to DoorDash pocketing those tips to offset 
base pay, you see people furious about it. My yeah. first question to this was, is that illegal? And it turns out there's a, a, a law on the books in D.C. which makes it illegal. But it's only in D.C., uh, right. as far as I can tell. It's not some federal statute. You know, a, a company can do, look at restaurants and what right. they do with tips in there. It, it varies from restaurant to restaurant. DoorDash happens to do it this way. They're not taking money from the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, right. delivery guys. They're just not giving them all of the money that's out there. So it's they're not losing out necessarily. For those of us who order in on a, on a regular basis, it's, it's unfortunate to know because when you read a story like this, this doesn't incentivize me to add a bigger tip because now knowing that it's DoorDash getting a lot of it, not the actual delivery guy. Right. Uh, but it does also provide another option, which is just to provide cash when they come to your uh, door. You're going to say give them cash? And yeah, but you don't also have, we now live in a cashless society. Sign the app, yeah. Have dollars, so it's... Well, it makes you wonder about a lot of these platform companies, too, where they say that, you know, you are adding a tip right. at the, at the Look, end of your Look, it's now purchase. on Uber. It's now on Lyft. 10, 15, 20 yeah. percent. Sometimes they've actually bumped it up they, 15, they, 20, they 25 percent. Yeah. Yeah. You go to Vegas, it's 30 percent and up. I don't know if you guys have been in a Vegas cab recently. Uh, topic mm -hmm. five, Chris Jenner, matriarch of the Jenner and Kardashian clan, talking to us on Squawk Box this morning. Her daughter, Kylie, just sold a majority stake in her company, Kylie Cosmetics, to beauty giant Cody for $600 million, valuing the company at $1.2 billion. I asked her if she considered the sale of any of her other daughter's businesses, and here's what she had to say. I think that if they do uh, grow the business and they're able to sell something and, 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 and keep um, you know, having a hand in it, that that's kind of the ideal situation. What do you think? What, Kim hasn't had that opportunity? I think she must. She's getting calls left, right, and center. Oh, the yeah. question is, do they have to right partner with a major company? And kind of the Kardashian brand is strong, you know, as as. It's ever. not just a brand issue, though, but it's also an infrastructure issue, right? right? Which is, do you do you want to build? I mean, I think the Cody right. deal is about that. Really. Absolutely, You're, right. she's able to grow the company now. They've got the distribution. She's got but the, she the still followers. Owns half of it, so she's going to benefit on the way up too. You know, say takes a little you, bit of cash off the table. Say what These you will about the Kardashians, but look at you, their. You, you, know, I, I, you don't need to look at me because I will tell you, those women. I spent some time with them just two weeks ago. The most disciplined entrepreneurs I've seen in a very, very long time. The hardest working. I mean, right. you can watch. I watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians, but this. Spending time with them changed my whole perception of how this whole business operates. I mean, not just about reality. Stars, it's a real right? empire. It's yeah. a real empire. That reality show would have sputtered years ago if they didn't have that work ethic and that drive to do something more from a business standpoint with, with their brand and with their, you know, just you, public profile. They were really savvy early on with Is it that. Kris Jenner, the momager, or is it someone else oh, that's playing, playing a big role in helping I them she's the, the, really captivate their audience? I think and Chris is, is the CEO, but I think she's got uh, a lot of C COOs. And what they've really done, what's so interesting is each of the daughters has almost segmented a yeah. certain demo. Mm -hmm. Right. So they actually, even though they, can, they compete with each other, but to a large degree, they've actually figured out how to how to go down. Right, because Kim K has lines. her own makeup line, so does yep. Kylie, but they speak to different generations. When you, were interviewing, KKW, yeah. when you were interviewing them recently, I was sitting there thinking, what would Robert Kardashian think about this today? Right? The, I, the, I remember the, Robert the, the Kardashian. Patriot, yeah, patriot yeah, absolutely. He, yeah. You know what he would be? Very proud. I'm sure he would be. Uh, Leslie, Bill, Seema, thank you guys. What a fun conversation. Okay, coming up when we return, a lot more on the exchange. Making America the leader in cryptocurrencies one of the CFTC's top priorities. We're going to talk to the chairman about he, how he plans to achieve that and what role Facebook's Libra could play in it. The exchange is back in two minutes. If you're turning 65, on three, our unlimited data is actually unlimited, like four reels. That means you can scroll and scroll and scroll through all the Black Friday deals. Because we have no speed limits, no data caps, and you'll be 5G ready at no extra cost. Wow, so many savings. Our Black Friday deals are now on. Save up to £480. Switch to three, in-store or online. See 3.co.uk forward slash unlimited dash data. Savings on selected phones on 24 month contracts. Ends 5th of December. Terms apply. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Christmas is such a magical time of year for little ones. But why should the big kids miss out? This season, take the family to Santa's Wonderland. 
at West London Audi. You get to test drive the latest Audi models, and the children get to test drive the latest toys with Santa. There's something for the whole family. Visit santaswonderlab.com to find out more about how to register for your place at Santa's Wonderlab this Christmas. I wish me a Merry Christmas. I wish me a Merry Christmas. I wish me a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Don't forget yourself this Christmas. Get 90 gig of data for the price of 30 on the stunning Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus. Search O2 Christmas deals. O2 refresh credit by Telefonica UK Limited. Contract eligibility in terms apply. Welcome back to The Exchange. The CFTC taking the lead in regulating cryptocurrencies as the assets gain traction in the marketplace. It's one of the top priorities for the agency as they set a goal of making sure the U.S. is the leader in the digital asset and blockchain space. Joining us exclusively from the CME Group's Global Financial Leadership Conference is CFTC Chairman Heath Tarbert. Good morning, or I should say good afternoon to you. Um, You know, the question I would ask you is in this larger conversation about where the U.S. stands in digital cryptocurrencies, it feels like there's uh, different forces that are fighting each other. You, you want this, you want the country to be at the top of the game, and yet I will tell you, I think that uh, some of the other folks uh, in government right now, and I'm thinking even of, uh, of Secretary Steven Mnuchin and others, and even the president, have some real reservations about cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin and Libra. Thank you so much for having me, Andrew. No, I I want the United States to lead, particularly in the blockchain technology that underlies digital assets. But many of the concerns that Secretary Mnuchin has, and I I have as well, uh, in terms of of, of anti-money laundering, making sure that these markets continue to have integrity. So I, I don't think there's actually any space between us. It's just that for those that are commodities regulated by us, we want to make sure we create an environment where these markets have integrity and we're able to regulate them and they're able to innovate. Okay, so explain this one to me because I have yet to understand it. Uh, Facebook announces Libra and Washington uh, goes out of its brain, out of their minds. They, they can't even fathom that this is happening. Yet Bitcoin, which has been around now for over a decade and has nobody that you can call. There is nobody you can pick up the phone and say, hey, excuse me, there's a problem here, I need your help, I want to regulate you. Um, nobody seems to be uh, having at least meaningful problems to the same level that they have with Libra. Why is that? Well, they're fundamentally different products, Andrew. And, and I think we also know how Bitcoin works. As you say, it's been around for 10 years. So we have a very good idea of how it works and we're able to classify that not as a security, but as a commodity. Uh, whereas Libra is developing. And there are a bunch of unanswered questions and and also the way that it's structured, uh, linking it directly to a set of of national currencies, very different product. But uh, I guess the the larger question is, if any of these were to reach escape velocity, and I don't know what escape velocity even means, but if if Bitcoin really were, were being used in a meaningful way, it would upend... The idea of a monopoly currency that the U.S. has or any government has on on any of these currencies. And by the way, similarly, if Libra were to truly take off, you'd have billions of people operating with it virtually overnight. How much do you think that weighs on regulators? No, I definitely think that's something that people uh, are are thinking about. Uh, I never use the term cryptocurrency. I've always used the term digital assets because in my view, uh, consistent with what a number of others have said, these are not yet legal tender. They're not money. They're not currency like traditional currencies. So something like Bitcoin is very important. But again, we classify it as a commodity. It has the volatility of a commodity. And we have futures markets trading it alongside other commodities. Okay, so what has to happen, though, for these things to reach escape velocity? Meaning, from a regulatory perspective, what, what steps, you know, if you look out over the next year or two or three or longer, you think the things that are going to happen to get there, if you think that we do get there? Well, I think it's entirely possible that I get there. And my emphasis has not been on any single digital asset type, but really on the blockchain technology underlying it. Right. And blockchain technology is being used first and foremost for these digital assets. But ultimately, I could see it overtaking the Internet or being effectively parallel to the Internet 
in using a variety of different kinds of transactions, not just the financial system, but in other types of transactions as well. In terms of the velocity and getting it to the point, I think really a key uh, development, which we haven't seen yet, but we're starting to see in other countries, is if countries start accepting uh, these digital assets alongside other currencies. So, for example, they say that you can use them to pay your taxes. So that's a very different, I think we're far from that at this stage. Um, at this point, we're trying to get our arms around it. We're trying to understand the technology. We're trying to understand the financial stability concerns. We're also trying to understand how they can address uh, anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. If you you were to rank order where the United States plays or ranks in this game to the extent it's a game, where's the United States right now relative to China, it's hard. South Korea, you name the other countries that are involved in this? Well, I can tell you this. I don't think we're at the top of the list. We may not be at the bottom. I think the Libra Association is a good example of this. Uh, they could have chosen any place in the world to set up. They chose Switzerland. My understanding is a second choice was Singapore. I don't know where the United States was, but it clearly wasn't first on the list. I think whoever ends up leading in this technology will end up writing the rules of the road for the rest of the world. And my emphasis is on making sure that the United States is a leader. Chairman, uh, we got to run. Thank you for that. By the way, I'll give you one just little, t a little, little piece of information. The reason why Facebook wanted to do it in Switzerland originally was because they were so nervous, not about regulators in the United States, they were actually trying to uh, solve for what they thought was going to be pushed back in Europe, if you can believe that. So, anyway, Chairman Terber, uh, Terber, thank well, there you. There we have it. Appreciate it. We will continue thank this. I so hope, hope to talk to you again. Uh, still ahead, we got a lot more in on the exchange. Self-care, now a booming business. We're going to talk to the founder, some big-name brands in the space about the future of that trend. The exchange is right back after this. It was Sophie's big day. By the way, she's the next Mozart. As usual, we were behind schedule. But Sophie's enthusiasm could not be dampened. Not even by a runaway donor. We powered through it in our Toyota Prius. Because the star's got to shine. No matter what. It's unbelievable what you can do in the Prius. Toyota. Let's go places. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies. Or call 1-800-514-7800. Coventry Direct. Redefining insurance. Ten candidates, each with a vision. Moderators Rachel Maddow, Andrea Mitchell, Kristen Welker, and The Washington Post's Ashley Parker ask, what will you do? How will you do it? The next Democratic debate, tomorrow at 9 on MSNBC. This is Kate. Hey. She takes two prescriptions. Kate's son, Jack, takes one too. Kate works hard and thought she had good insurance. But she still pays too much. That's no good. So Kate downloaded the GoodRx app. Now she can compare prescription prices to find the best discounts. She even beats her insurance price. Good for you, Kate. Good for you. GoodRx. Stop paying too much for your prescriptions. Download the free app today. Is your credit card debt stressing you out? Take control. A personal loan could help you crush high interest rates and reduce your monthly payments so you can get out of debt faster and save money. Whether you're a credit stud or a credit starter, at Credible.com, we help you find great rates from multiple lenders. In three minutes, get actual pre-qualified rates. Have the money you need as quickly as tomorrow and start living your life. Visit Credible.com to see how much you could save.
My Squawk Box uh, partner, Becky Quick, sitting down for an exclusive interview with Walmart CEO Doug McMillan at CNBC's Evolve Los Angeles today. He weighed in on the store's stance on guns in the wake of the shooting at a Walmart in Oklahoma yesterday. It's a very div divisive issue, obviously. And what we've tried to do is just come forward with some common sense steps. And we would love to see government do the same thing, just some practical common sense steps to help make the country safer. And as we've said to everyone, we don't think the status quo is acceptable. We think there needs to be change, and there can be change while protecting the rights of gun owners. Have you gotten blowback from your customer base? Um, a little bit, but no, not, not much. I think most people understand we're not trying to make a political statement here. We're just trying to help create a safer environment. And you can catch Becky's full interview with Doug McMillan tomorrow on Squawk Box starting at 7.30 a.m. Eastern time. Meanwhile, do-it-yourself health care using vitamins and over-the-counter products to soothe what ails you is a nearly $2 trillion business. That's with a T. We're going to talk to the founder of Ollie Vitamins and Method Cleaning Products about the keys to his success in that market next. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November, while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Christmas is such a magical time of year for little ones. But why should the big kids miss out? This season, take the family to Santa's Wonderland at West London Audi. You get to test drive the latest Audi models, and the children get to test drive the latest toys with Santa. There's something for the whole family. Visit santaswonderlab.com to find out more about how to register for your place at Santa's Wonderlab this Christmas. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit with our award-winning eight-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just $12.99 and our award-winning range of Hortus Artisan gins and gin liqueurs from only $9.99. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes an eye. Whether you call yourself a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or something else, the road to 2020 is on TuneIn. Oh, what a night! It, and, and a, a complete earthquake. This was Follow earthquake. every step of the Democratic primaries while hearing the latest headlines from the White House with live 24-hour news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox News Talk, and more. We're closing in on the first results in the battle for the White House. It is Experience be the election through the sources you trust with the nonstop news channels on TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen and favorite ESPN Daily on TuneIn. Welcome back to The Exchange. Consumer uh, goods giant Procter & Gamble looking to boost its healthcare business by targeting the growing do-it-yourself area. My next guest has built a career on disrupting the consumer packaged goods space through three ventures, which together are now valued at more than a billion dollars. Uh, for more, we're going to go out to CBC's Evolve conference in Los Angeles, where I'm joined by Eric Ryan. He's the co-founder of Method, Ali, and Welly. And Eric, I should tell you, I'm genuinely I'm so interested in your success because most people have one good idea, and you've now had three, and there's probably more in there somewhere. But what I was so fascinated by is you seem to look at industries that... I wouldn't really even consider trying to upend because who would have ever thought Band-Aids 
uh, could be upended. How do, you, how do you do it, and how do you think about it, and how do you decide which category you're going into? Because we've now seen you do it three separate times. Hi, thanks, Andrew. You know, my model is really different than other entrepreneurs. I don't start with ideas. I really like to start with a category and find a space that I think is big and is, is right for disruption. And then what I do is try to figure out what is the cultural shift, meaning what is the big macro trend that that category is missing, and then in between, okay, so, that's but back up. So you're sitting around, I don't know where you're sitting around, and you're saying to yourself, Band-Aids. Band-Aids need to be disrupted. Why? How did that happen? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm a father of three kids, uh, two who like to get hurt and bleed a lot. And I just found whenever um, a kid was hurt, of course, it's always a sense of urgency. And I realized the hardest thing with bandages was actually trying to find them in the house, not actually applying them. So that was kind of the insight that there was an opportunity to start to reinvent the experience to help the parents find what they need when they need it. Okay, so it's about finding it. No, but, but part of it was making them look cool, making the experience better and different. Right? That's absolutely. So what we really do is we figure there's probably not a great way to, to really differentiate these products just on the attributes alone. So we look at how do you reinvent the entire experience? And you'll see a big common thread of all of our brands is how we leverage creativity and design and really use that to, to, to change the experience for the consumer and turn something that you need into something you actually want. And you do a lot of this through Target. Tell me, why, why Target? Uh, Target's a great partner, and you know they are one of the few retailers that are also very design-led, where you've got creative directors like Todd Waterbury, who actually have like a great leadership position. And so they work as true merchants with us, and they really give us the space to bring to them these newly imagined brands and get behind it. Okay, so always going to be um, like consumer packaged goods for you? I mean, could you decide? You just Like, I think about socks. I was thinking to myself... What, what industry do I think needs to be... Socks, to me, need to be upended. It seems like a ridiculous, ridiculous business that could be fixed. But how do you think about which is the next one? Yeah, for, for me, um, I look for a place that is a really big category that also has a predictable business model. I like profitable businesses. So I look for spaces where there's an economic opportunity as well as where we can really apply design and creativity. And you're right, stocks is a great place. The financial markets, like taking something that feels very intangible for people and leveraging design in a way to make it more tangible and change the experience it is probably very, very ripe. Okay, I'll get you my number. We'll talk socks. We'll find uh, an opportunity and uh, at minimum, you know, just a little equity stake in the socks business. Uh, Eric Ryan, thank you. Appreciate uh, you uh, speaking with us Thanks, today Andrew. and uh, you doing the conference out in L.A. Uh, that does it for us on The Exchange. Power Lunch starts right now. Thank you, Andrew. I'm Bill Griffin. Here is what we are working on uh, at 2 on Power Lunch. Retail gets wrecked. Two earnings disasters, Home Depot and Kohl's, under pressure today after big misses. Both retailers say that there could be more pain ahead as well. Plus, tech on track for its best year in a decade this year. But if you missed the rally, don't worry. We'll tell you how you can still get in on that party. And then later, speaking of hot trades, Chipotle, one of the best performing stocks in the S&P this year, with shares nearly doubling. CEO is going to join us for an exclusive interview. Power Lunch starts right now. Welcome to Power Lunch. I'm Courtney Reagan. Check out the markets and the performance here today. The record rally hitting a bit of a roadblock. The down the S&P 500, both lower than NASDAQ, though, hanging on to gains ever so slightly here. Take a look at Microsoft. That stock hitting a fresh record high today. The tech behemoth is now up about 50% so far this year. We'll, year. we'll have more on that later. As Bill mentioned, tech stocks really on a tear, having their best year since 2009, up about 41% the sector year to date. Bill, over to you. Thank you, Courtney. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, we start with two of the big movers today. That was, as I mentioned, Kohl's and Home Depot. Home Depot accounting for nearly all of the Dow's declines today. Both stocks sinking after reporting slowing sales. Are these reports a retail reality check? Is the consumer starting to crack? Let's head over to Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange for more on today's retail wreck. Robert? Hello, old friend. Good to see you as always. Uh, look, this is a difficult question right now because there was a lot of questions on the conference call about this. So Home Depot did beat. Comps were short. Sales missed, though, to what they call timing of certain investment initiatives. What's that all about? So take a look at Home Depot. Remember, it's up almost 40% 
for the year earlier. Now it's only up about 30% for the year. Uh, it's had a terrific run. You see it's only down about 5%. So what's all this uh, certain investment initiatives? That was the first question on the conference call. Is this about slowing the consumer? Are you trying to distract us here? Here's what management said. They saw strength across all of their departments. They saw particular growth in pro and do-it-yourself, that's DIY customers, and they saw growth in online traffic, conversion, and average ticket. In other words, they are not blaming consumer slowdown, and that's good news for us. I think one of the reasons Home Depot's only down about 5%. Retail, look, retail's down right across the board here, and that's because of Kohl's by and large here. So Kohl's missed on earnings and comps and lowered their full year guidance. Why is everybody else down? Because this has been a problem for all of the department stores and apparel companies in general, with a few exceptions. It's what I call the brick and mortar nightmare. Guys, you know about this. We've been talking about it for many, many uh, years here. The bottom line is what you've got is little or negative sales growth for companies overall. You've got uh, an inability of companies to open many more stores because many don't have the money they needed to invest in the, in the product. And there's no real path to growth for a lot of the retailers, particularly the department stores and the apparel companies. Courtney, this is your beat. You know all about the problems that we've had here. And Cole's basically reiterated those issues today. Back to you. Yeah, that's right, Bob. I will say I spoke with the CFO of Home Depot. He said we are absolutely not seeing softness in the consumer to reiterate your point. Thank you, Bob. So for more okay. on today's retail rec, we've got two analysts here to discuss both Kohl's and Home Depot. Liz Suzuki covers Home Depot with Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Bob Durbel covers Kohl's with Guggenheim Security. So Liz, let's start with you. This was a really interesting one for Home Depot and this is now the second quarter in a row that we've seen them lower their sales guidance, but for two very different reasons. For a long time, everyone said Home Depot is a great operator, but it seems like these problems are internal problems. So is that narrative changing? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the three things to take away from this quarter from Home Depot were, you know, one, this is the fourth quarter in a row that they've had sales that missed expectations, but the EPS still came in line. So even though sales growth has been a little bit disappointing, they're still able to deliver that bottom line growth. Second is, as you mentioned, this is the second time in a row that they've cut their comp guidance. You know, they talked about same store sales growth slowing. Um, at the beginning of the year, they said 5%. Now, last quarter, they had said 4%. Now they've taken it down to 35 percent. Now, last quarter, it was lumber deflation, which, you know, seemed like a reasonable thing to point to. This quarter, they're talking about some of those initiatives that they had started at the beginning of the year that are now slower to deliver some sales growth. And they think that that's still going to come. They said that that will be happening next year, that they expect to get more of that growth. So it's, it's really just a delay in timing on that sales growth, not a not necessarily a slowdown. Yeah, that's but, what I want to talk yeah. about. They are reinvesting in the company right now. Right. They're upgrading their stores, their their digital platform, their uh, supply chain. So they're reinvesting at the moment. Should we all have to be patient? I mean, even the CEO, though, admitted the, on the conference call that it's taking longer to see results than they expected here. But uh, right. maybe we just have to be patient with them. Yeah, I mean, one of the initiatives that they cited, they mentioned that they're really redoing their IT platform, and that's something that can take a long time, especially for a large-scale retailer like this. So they really want to get it right, make sure that the platform is correct before they you know, start putting in additional features. And so I think that's a reasonable thing to point to. But then the, the longer-term overarching theme here is that growth in renovation spending is starting to slow. It's still positive, but it is slowing. I mean, we talked about on, on in retail having negative or you know or very little growth. I mean, home improvement is still growing and it's still a pretty strong sector of retail, but it is starting to slow a little bit. So we're seeing that in our data. We're looking at all of the leading indicators of housing metrics, you know, um, financial health metrics, uh, real-time spending, and generally what it's pointing to is positive growth but softening. So if it's growing but softening, and right. you've got this duopoly of Home Depot and Lowe's, and the last two quarters, Lowe's actually outcomped Home Depot for the first time in a really long time. I think, right. the, you know, they only did it one other time in the last, I don't know, like four or five years. Yep. So if you're looking at these two and you have less money to spend as a homeowner renovating, where are you going, Lowe's or Home Depot? Well, I mean, I think most consumers will choose the place that's closest to them or that gives them the best price or has the product that they need in stock, right? So if you think about what a professional um, contractor is going to do in terms of their buying patterns, they're usually pretty loyal to a retailer until there's a reason to change that pattern. Now, either it's because they find that they're able to get product availability at one retailer versus the other, or it's because the pricing starts to get more competitive. And so I think some of what Lowe's is doing to really try to 
gain some of that uh, some of that market share, and not necessarily from Home Depot, but more so from independent smaller retailers, is that they're trying to make a much more compelling you know online platform, a more compelling pro platform, and having in stocks, and so they're investing a lot in inventory. For they that. report tomorrow morning. That's Do we right. hear essentially the same story from them necessarily? Do you think? I think when we hear from Home Depot, or sorry, when we hear from Lowe's tomorrow, we're likely to hear. I mean, I wouldn't expect them to cut the guidance because the reason Home Depot cut was from internal initiatives. So right. if Lowe's cuts their outlook, then maybe we can say, you know, things are actually softening more than we thought broadly for, for home improvement. So I think Lowe's will likely maintain their 3% same-store sales growth guidance. I think that their uh, their growth is going to actually look pretty robust. I, I think investors will be very focused on whether they uh, whether they beat Home Depot in terms of their U.S. same-store sales growth again. Uh, but I think what's going to come under more scrutiny is the uh, operating margin because last year the company was changing over a lot. They changed over their entire management team. Right. They were uh, destocking on inventory that was unproductive. They were uh, getting rid of stores that were that were unproductive as well. So a lot of change has happened in the last year, and we should start to see some of the benefits of that change happening now. But we'll see. They're making investments too, and right. that was a, right. a tripping point here today for Home Depot. Lisa yep. Suzuki, thank you very much Thanks. for being here with us today. Now let's turn to our attention to the biggest loser of the day in the stock market, Kohl's, retailer on track for its worst day since January of 17. And as we mentioned, here with us is Bob Durbel. He's Senior Managing Director and Retail Analyst at Guggenheim. And you maintain a buy rating, but you have lowered your price target now from 60 to $58, which is sort of a rounding error, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was, it was almost 60 yesterday, yeah, yeah. and the results were definitely disappointing, you know, from our perspective, from the company's perspective, and clearly from the street's perspective. All right. Uh, they're also a reinvestment story. They've been doing that, but the, the big strike against them is they're a department store. Nobody likes department stores anymore, right? Well, I, I think there's best of breed in department stores, and I think they also have the off-mall positioning. And and I think from the leadership perspective, Michelle Goss is, you know, is an outstanding executive. And I think, you know, this was Jill Tim's first call as the CFO. And I think this team, you know, they're they're willing to take risks. They're willing to try new things. They've got a lot of good initiatives. And, and in the stores, there's a lot of new merchandising initiatives that they started launching in the fall. You know, and I think as they gain traction, you know, the, the customer should respond favorably to those initiatives. When I spoke with Michelle Goss, she did point to the 20 new brands. And she said, look, we have to lean in. Kohl's is a place for value, but there has to be good product when consumers show up. I mean, how big of a difference can that make if you have exclusive brands, but they're new to the customer? I mean, how long does it take for them to warm up to buying those goods? Well, I think the Kohl's customers really, you know, they, they focus on value too. So you have to have good brands and add great value. And, and I think that's part of what they're still trying to you know, get right in this highly promotional environment. And I think when you think through this last quarter, you know, August they said was fine, but September was warm. There was a lot of disruption with some of the new launches and re-merchandising of some of the categories. I think that all added up to you know, a better October, but it wasn't good enough. And, and I think from the, the, the merchandising standpoint, they do have some new good launches coming. And, and I think the Scott Living piece, you know, the Coolabore by Ugg and Soft Home and the Nine West piece, it's, it's different merchandise, so it will take some time. They're spending more money on marketing and, and trying to you know, get the new customers in. You know, we haven't talked about the Amazon yeah, returns. Well, now we are, okay. uh, because uh, my wife has been to Kohl's three times in the past week, and it was every time to return something to Amazon, but she went to Kohl's. Yeah. It's fantastic. Did she yeah, walk out with anything yes. else? Uh, well, we'll find out here in about an hour. <laughs> She's there now, yeah. as a matter of fact. But the foot traffic is there, yeah. but are the sales following? Well, I mean, I think they did, there was a 360 basis point improvement from the first half of the year. So they were, you know, you know minus 3.2 to plus 0.4. So they returned to growth. So there is, you know, the positive piece. They're clearly going for market share, and they're going to be promotional. I think the environment is always promotional, heightened promotional activity, competitive in the fourth quarter. And, and Kohl's has a history of actually winning when it comes to sort of value and being promotional and aggressive, and, and we think that they will. We think that they have enough new initiatives um, to really you know, move the ball forward. Michelle Goss had said when I spoke to her that they are seeing some new customers come in sort of at a higher rate than they normally see a new customer come in when they're making that Amazon return and that they need to try to deliver on that value piece, which is why they lowered their earnings to give themselves some room to, it sounds like, take some more price cuts if they need to going into this promotional fourth quarter. Is that the right move to win the market share? Oh, I, I do think so. I mean, I, I think... You know, you, you want them to make money. I think she's also said that they will return to profitable growth next year as well. And and so, look, I, I think 
the environment is set up to be pretty promotional, and, and I think they're very realistic. They were actually one of the first retailers to cut the guidance earlier in the year, and they see the need to do it again. Um, you know, it's disappointing from our perspective, but I think they're doing the right things longer term, and I think th these guys are winners long term. Very good. Bob Durbel from Guggenheim. Thanks. Thank See you, you very later. much. Well, coming up, President Trump threatening to raise tariffs on China even higher. But the markets are shrugging off the drama, at least right now. Are we over the trade turmoil? Plus, Chipotle started off the year piping hot, but the stock has been flat ever since. What can we get it sizzling? What can get it sizzling again? The CEO of Chipotle is about to join us. Stick around. Power Lunch. We'll be right back. This CNBC program is sponsored by Payton and Regal. I love Black Friday. Busy shops, crazy people, average deals. It's so much fun. <laughs> Said no one ever. So be savvy and do Black Friday the easy way with Smarty. Grab a huge 100 gig data sim for just £17 a month on the Mega Plan. And with no credit checks, speed restrictions or contracts tying you down, you can kick back with the best Black Friday deal around. Now that's Smarty. Search Smarty Mobile to find out more, but hurry, as this deal won't be around for long. See smarty.co.uk for terms. If you're planning on driving this weekend, expect delays on the A406 North Circular Road. There'll be road closures between Tottenham and Edmonton from 10pm on Friday the 22nd of November to 5am on Monday the 25th of November, while we carry out essential maintenance and repairs. All roads in the surrounding area will be extremely busy, so please allow more time for your journey and expect delays in the area. Plan ahead and check alternative routes at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Christmas is such a magical time of year for little ones. But why should the big kids miss out? This season, take the family to Santa's Wonder Lab at West London Audi. You get to test drive the latest Audi models, and the children get to test drive the latest toys with Santa. There's something for the whole family. Visit santaswonderlab.com to find out more about how to register for your place at Santa's Wonder Lab this Christmas. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit with our award-winning eight-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just $12.99 and our award-winning range of Hortus Artisan gins and gin liqueurs from only $9.99. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores, excludes and I. Going, going, gone. Some things just don't hang around. Like a great deal in Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Right now you can get the Samsung Galaxy S10 for just $29.99 a month. But this deal ends Sunday 1st of December. Catch it before it's gone. Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Best ever Black Friday based on range of products in promotion. Was £35.99 now £29.99. Offer ends 1st of December. 36 month credit agreement. Rolling monthly usage agreement. Subject to status. Phase policy applies. See tescomobile.com slash terms. President Trump threatening even more tariffs on China. Kayla Tausche joining us with the context of those comments. Hi, Kayla. Hi, Courtney. President Trump making those comments to the press at the beginning of a cabinet meeting today with his economic team looking on, saying that China is going to have to do a deal he likes. I have a good relationship with China. We'll see what happens. But I'm very happy right now. And if we don't make a deal with China, I'll just raise the tariffs even higher. Thank you very much. Another trade issue in focus here today is the new NAFTA. The White House has not reached an agreement with House Democrats yet, but President Trump says he believes that Speaker Pelosi is stalling in order to use the deal to secure support from moderates on impeachment. I've been told, and who knows if this is so, but I think it's so, I have pretty good authority on it, that she's using USMCA because she doesn't have the impeach impeachment votes, so she's using USMCA to get the impeachment vote. As for the impeachment hearing today, President Trump said he watched a little of it, that he's never known or seen Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who remains the top Ukraine expert here at the National Security Council. Guys, back to you. All right, Kayla, thank you very much. So, to the markets now with the Dow pulling back after hitting a record high at the open. The S&P and the NASDAQ are trying to hold in to, to gains right now, which would keep them in records. But the markets overall seem to be shrugging off the trade uncertainty. Is that a positive sign of what is to come? Michael Cugino is president and portfolio manager with Permanent Portfolio Funds. 
Kirk Hartman is president and global CIO with Wells Fargo Asset Management. Good to see both. Thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon. Michael, we saw a report out today that said that a lot of uh, hedge funds are investing in companies who would benefit from a trade deal. They're anticipating that one is on the way. Uh, what, do you, what do you think and what would that do for the markets? Oh, I think that's probably consistent with the market's recent behavior. Um, I think that uh, even a limited deal of do no more further damage and maybe agree on some small points would probably be a win at this point. I think structurally they're not going to get anywhere more than that. And I think that's what the market's expecting. That's why stocks have bled up. That's why interest rates have begun to creep up and the, the curve has positively sloped again. And you've seen a resurgence of growth-oriented stocks, materials, industrials, transports, financials, et cetera. So it all does make sense. And honestly, uh, if that story doesn't happen, then you're going to see a sell-off. But I don't think Trump really said anything different today than he's already said before. And Kirk, what, what do you think? I mean, some of the other pieces of the wall of worry in the past that had the market pretty volatile Brexit, the Fed, some of the other, you know, slowdown uh, internationally, economically speaking. Now we're at all-time highs. What happened to all those worries? Well, I think you have the probability of a very bifurcated outcome, and I think there will be some kind of deal. Um, a lot of those worries are still there, but there's just so much riding on uh, China right now and the trade negotiations. I think odds favor some kind of deal, and the market is certainly pricing that in. But um, if there's not a deal, uh, to your other guests' uh, point, uh, the market could go down. But um, I remain op optimistic. I think uh, China is in a quasi-recession, and I think uh, the U.S. administration wants a deal. So we will get something. Michael, we spoke a little bit at the top of the show about the strength of tech and then talking about investing in tech if indeed we get some kind of a deal. Where are you when you're looking at that big sector? I mean, would you go a little slimmer? Would you look at something like semis, although they've had a pretty big run too, up about 48% year to date here. How are you playing a name like, a, like tech? Huge, Courtney. Um, you know, we're definitely involved in that space as well as some of the industry sectors I mentioned. And we look at different subsectors. And certainly with tech, you have some good valuations, some very overpriced valuations, some companies that are just so overpriced that they're going to take a period of time to grow into their valuations. And I think it's a company by company uh, specific issue. We got into in semis early in the year when there was a big sell off. We've been happy with their trade. We're in Facebook as an example of a big cap name that's still incredibly profitable despite all the negative news around them all year. Um, and then there's other areas. Um, Autodesk is another software company that we own. Um, you know, so we're in the software space, we're in the, uh, the semi-space, and always looking for new opportunities. Kirk, for you, I see that you like financials, among others. That's a bit of a contrary play right now. Well, I think the yield curve is steep. And um, in terms of crowded trades, there's a lot of crowding in technology. Uh, financials are at a 12 and a half uh, PE versus 17, 18 for the broad market. So I think uh, financials offer value. I also like dividend yield both domestically and abroad because I think that's a good way uh, to hedge your bets, so to speak. And what's interesting here is you see a rotation higher. And yesterday you had things like REITs, utilities, and a great company, and not recommending it one way or the other, but some Something like Caterpillar. So you've seen these kind of uh, defensive um, utility uh, dividend yielding type stocks that are rotating higher. All right, Michael Cugino, Kirk Hartman, thank you both for joining us today on the markets. Thanks. Thank you. Let's head over to the bond market. Rick Santelli is tracking the action at the CME. Hi, Rick. Thanks, Courtney. You know, looking at stocks, two out of three indices doing pretty well, and even the Dow is still not far under 28,000. But Treasury yields, especially long maturities, are definitely slipping. If you look at a two-day of twos, notice yesterday's low in the context of today's. Realize, we're at 159, we breached 160, but only down one basis point. Now let's go to the farthest maturity, 30-year bonds. Look at a two-day. Look at the difference, how much lower the right side is. They're now down six basis points on the day. If they closed here, it'd be the second lowest close for the month of November. And of course, that means flattening curve. Look at a one week of tens minus twos, around 18 plus, open it up to mid-October. Basically, in a week, we've gone from 28 to 18, but even at 18, it's still a lot better for the psyche of investors than it was when it was at minus five. Mr. Bill, back to you. Mr. Rick, thank you, my friend. See you later. Well, as we've been talking about, tech has been the hottest sector in the market this year, up more than 40% as a group. We're going to tell you what you can still buy, though, to catch that rally. we got traders weighing in on that. 
Plus, one of the hottest stocks in the market this year has been Chipotle. The CEO, Brian Nickel, will join us coming up. Much more Power Lunch coming your way. The Bond Report. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit. With our award-winning eight-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just $12.99. And our award-winning range of Hortus Artis and Gins and Gin Liqueurs from only $9.99. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes an eye. Going, going, gone. Some things just don't hang around. Like a great deal in Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Right now you can get the Samsung Galaxy. Galaxy S10 for just $29.99 a month. But this deal ends Sunday 1st of December. Catch it before it's gone. Tesco Mobile's best ever Black Friday event. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Best ever Black Friday based on range of products in promotion. Was £35.99 now £29.99. Offer ends 1st of December. 36 month credit agreement. Rolling monthly usage agreement. Subject to status. Phase policy applies. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Ready for the end. Scores! fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. It takes it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. College football is live on TuneIn. Listen for free to games from more than 140 schools all season long. To the 10, all the way to the checkerboard. But he stays on his feet and scores. Number two, Ohio State looks to clinch the Big Ten Eastern title division outright and a spot in the Big Ten Conference Championship game as they host the ninth-ranked Penn State Nittany Lions in Columbus. This Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern, listen to every call and every game of your school all season long for free on TuneIn. Penn State at Ohio State. Just search college to listen today you're listening to tune in where you can hear all the audio you love in one place live nfl games the hottest music breaking news and podcasts push play and go about your day only on tune in NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. He runs inside. He's got a 10, 5, touchdown! This Thursday, hear the home and away call as the Indianapolis Colts visit the Houston Texans at 8.20 p.m. Eastern. Firing, caught, kick, five, touchdown! At home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Introducing a new podcast, ESPN Daily. When you want to go beyond your feed, when you want to get inside the score, when you want to get behind the highlight, there's ESPN Daily. Go deeper into the stories of the moment. Get the exclusive access and insider perspective that only ESPN can give you. ESPN Daily, hosted by me, Mina Kimes. Listen now to ESPN Daily on TuneIn. Welcome back to Power Lunch. I'm Mike Santoli at the New York Stock Exchange. Tech stocks scoring all-time highs today and pushing the sector's valuation to its most expensive since January of 2005. Stocks such as Salesforce, AMD, Adobe, NVIDIA, and Microsoft all trading with forward multiples far above the rest of the market. So can they justify the high price tags right now? Let's bring in your Trading Nation team today. Todd Gordon of TradingAnalysis.com and Quinn Tatro of Jewel Financial. So, Todd, obviously really strong trends in multiple areas of tech. Shows people are urgent to pay up at these prices. Uh, What would you pick out uh, among the candidates there? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, you know, we've been contained through 2019. We just recently broke resistance. So I think we have a little bit of a momentum trade. And two names uh, that I like. First, CRM. Uh, we've just broken from a consolidation uh, over the last uh, year and a half. I just added half a position based on this segment to my portfolio through 163. No reason we shouldn't test the upper end around 200. Again, I'm not concerned about the multiple in this kind of momentum market. Another name is AMD. This has been the most storied stock. Love this chart. Um, again, trading. 
50, 35, excuse me, 35 times forward earnings, you know, double the S&P. Uh, AMD also just broke a 20-year uh, downtrend resistance here. Uh, we're trading into the 40s. I don't see no reason we shouldn't be able to get up to that 50 handle. I've owned this stock uh, th since 21. I continue to add to this one. I like the upside uh, move here in AMD. All right. We'll see if it can uh, put some distance between it and that 25-year trend uh, that you have there. Quint, uh, what about you? I mean, uh, obviously, you can uh, you can find value even in high multiple stocks. Where would you uh, would you go? Yeah, we're not a big fan of chasing the momentum. Uh, I think previous guess is right. These are strong uptrends. They justify the valuation because they have incredible cash flow, Teflon balance sheets, reliable earnings. But we like to look at the areas that we think maybe have. Uh, room to run here. Uh, look at a Facebook, uh, incredible valuation, cheap uh, on comparables going forward, uh, as well as Square. We think that that stock's been uh, beaten up enough and uh, looks ready to run. And then totally unrelated, but as a trade, we actually like Lyft here and uh, think that that's bottom. So we do find areas out there that are not yet stretched fundamentally that are attractive from a trading perspective. All right. Lyft may or may not be a tech company, but certainly is a bit of a contrarian pick right there. We'll see if it works. Todd and Quinn, thank you very much. For more Trading Nation, head to our website or follow us on Twitter at Trading Nation. Courtney, back over to you. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, coming up on Power Lunch, an exclusive interview with Chipotle CEO Brian Nickel. We'll talk about the company's growth plans, delivery wars, and much more. Plus, former Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein weighing in on the recent attacks from Senator Elizabeth Warren on wealth. We'll bring you his comments next. And New York now joining California in suing e-cigarette maker Juul for targeting its products towards teens. Those details and much more when Power Lunch returns. And now, the latest from TradingNation.CNBC.com and a word from our sponsor. In determining your entry points with rising stocks, look to buy pullbacks at support levels, such as uptrend lines, prior lows, Fibonacci retracement levels, or moving averages. I'm Lee Bull, and Schwab is the better place for traders. On three, our unlimited data is actually unlimited, like four reels. That means you can scroll and scroll and scroll through all the Black Friday deals. Because we have no speed limits, no data caps, and you'll be 5G ready at no extra cost. Wow, so many savings. Our Black Friday deals are now on. Save up to £480. Switch to three, in-store or online. See 3.co.uk forward slash unlimited dash data. Savings on selected phones on 24-month contracts. Ends 5th of December. Terms apply. At Lidl, we're big on getting in the Christmas spirit. With our award-winning 8-year-old Queen Mongol blended Scotch whiskey for just twelve ninety nine, And our award-winning range of Hortus Artisan gins and gin liqueurs from only nine ninety nine. Big on a Christmas you can believe in. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. Subject to availability, selected stores, excludes an eye. Into the end zone. Touchdown. NFL fans hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. He runs inside. He's got a 10, 5, touchdown. This Thursday, hear the home and away call as the Indianapolis Colts visit the Houston Texans at 8.20 p.m. Eastern. Firing, caught, 10, 5, touchdown. At home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. When you're not listening to your team, take it to the end zone, the rim, or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. A lot of people aren't aware that TuneIn lets you listen to the same terrestrial stations that you pick up on your FM AM dial, except you can hear them from anywhere. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. Smart Sports Wagering Talk is now on TuneIn. This is Brett Musburger. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Search B-E-T-R. Be better informed. Be better prepared. And remember, cash and tickets is what it's all about. From ESPN and the award-winning producers of The Sterling Affairs comes the latest season of 30 for 30 podcasts. Four brand new stories of espionage. He wanted this team to be the Barcelona of women's basketball. 
resilience. I started to scream. I tried to get away. Corruption. It's the culture of win at all costs. And rebirth. How will we ever rebuild it? 30 for 30 Podcasts, Season 6. Listen in favorite 30 for 30 podcasts on TuneIn. I'm Contessa Brewer. Here's your CNBC News update this hour. Washington and Seoul could not reach an agreement on sharing the cost of defending South Korea. Seoul's chief negotiator accused the U.S. of demanding a drastic increase. The U.S. blamed South Korea for being unresponsive. Unfortunately, the proposals that were put forward by the uh, Korean negotiating team were not responsive to our request for fair and equitable burden sharing. The Attorney General of Washington, D.C. is suing DoorDash, saying the food delivery service pocketed tips customers thought were going to delivery workers. He's hoping to recover millions of dollars in tip money and to impose civil penalties on the company. DoorDash says the accusations don't have any merit. Panda cub Bebe is saying goodbye to his home at the National Zoo in Washington, heading for a new home in China. The zoo has a breeding agreement with China that all cubs born at the National Zoo then get transported to China when they turn four years old. And we've reached that time. Boo-hoo. Bye-bye, Bebe. <laughs> there, surely there's one more that I can add in. Bob, no, it doesn't Go work. ahead. Go baba. ahead. He needs a baba. <laughs> I need a baba. Anybody needs a baba. <laughs> That's very good. Thank you, Contessa. I hope he has a safe trip home. Well, let's take a check on the markets. The Dow is the only one in the red right now, falling from record highs at the start of the session. The S&P and the Nasdaq both holding on to their gains, at least for now. For now. Time for some uh, power movers today. Service now is trading higher. It's uh, being added to the S&P 500 Thursday because Celgene was bought out by Bristol Myers. That means that index fund managers are going to have to buy service now to put in their indices. Shares of Myovant Sciences soaring as that company's drug to treat prostate cancer meets the primary goal of a trial. One analyst called it a home run, but here's a grand slam. The big mover yesterday was Corona Therapeutics. The stock gained nearly 500% yesterday. It's continuing to soar today on optimism about its drug to treat schizophrenia. That is amazing. We checked. 500% is it, it not an error. That that that's real. Yeah. Real number. Well, the oil market is closing for the day. Probably not 500%. Let's go to Rahel Solomon at the CNBC Commodity Desk. Not at all, Courtney. Hello. So yet another tough day, in fact, for crude oil. WTI, you can see, settling around 55.10 a barrel, down more than 3.4%. Brent, uh, 60.77 a barrel, down about 2.67%. What a difference a few days can make, though, because you might remember on Thursday, Brent had reached 63.65 a barrel its highest level since September 24th. Investors today, meantime, reacting to the latest pessimism over the status of the U.S.-China trade dispute. And, of course, that impact on oil demand also not helping. Higher than expected Norwegian oil production and forecasts of rising U.S. crude inventories. Looking ahead, we get the latest API supply report data in about an hour and also the government's official figures tomorrow. Bill, send it back to you. Rahel, thank you very much. So the impeachment hearings in Washington have resumed at this hour after that lunch break. They are expected to continue into the evening. Ilan Mui joins us now with a recap of the action so far today. Ilan. Well, Bill, lawmakers still appear to be in vote, so we are still waiting for that second hearing to begin. But there was some pretty dramatic testimony this morning, particularly from national security official Alexander Vindman. He had repeatedly sounded the alarm over that July 25th phone call. And since then, he's been attacked personally by President Trump, and Republicans have questioned his loyalty. But this morning, Vindman said this was his duty. Because this is America. This is the country I've served and defended, uh, that all of my brothers have served, and here, right matters. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Now, one of the questions surrounding Vindman is whether he followed the appropriate chain of command in raising his concerns. This afternoon, we will hear directly from his boss, Timothy Morrison, and also testifying will be Kurt Volker. He's one of the so-called three amigos who apparently was part of a back channel of diplomacy established within the administration to Ukraine. Guys, these hearings have been running about five hours each. The next one we're hearing will start around 3.15, so we will keep you posted and bring you all the latest. Back over to you. Well, thank you very much, Alana. I'm sure your hand is probably a little tired from taking notes after five hours at a time. 
Well, Chipotle is serving up profits as it beefs up its digital and delivery businesses. And investors, well, they're eating it up. Chipotle shares up a massive 78% in 2019. And not only is it the best performing restaurant struck this year in the S&P 500, it's one of the best performing stocks in the entire index. And since CEO Brian Nickel took the reins in March 2018, the stock has more than doubled in value of 140%. Our own Kate Rogers is live at CNBC Evolve in Los Angeles with Brian Nickel for a Power Lunch exclusive. Over to you, Kate. Hi, Court. Thank you so much. And Brian, thanks for joining us at Evolve today. Yeah, great to be here. So Courtney just mentioned delivery. There is a recent note from Bernstein basically saying that non-pizza players like Chipotle, McDonald's, etc., are the companies that will be able to see the most growth moving forward. I would love to know how Chipotle is looking at delivery as we move ahead. Sure. So we see delivery as a really incremental occasion. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it happens off premise. And what's great about our business is our food uh, travels really well. You know, a burrito is delicious delivered. A bowl is delicious delivered. And then we have the operating system where we have a second digital make line. So all those orders come in. We make